so for today, uh, we have uh, seven, um, uh, like today we are going to discuss on uh, charging infrastructure, uh, planning policy and operations. Um, so this, uh, this session uh, will, dis will focus on the broad spectrum of charging infrastructure. Uh, addressing the needs and public uh, needs of public authorities, um, such as, uh, for example, standards, available technologies, enabling policies, and consideration on charging infrastructure planning processes. For this, today we have uh, seven presentations by the experts from FIER, uh, DTU or Technical University of Denmark, uh, TNO, uh, UITP, uh, CRF, uh, De La Salle University in Philippines, and uh, National Cheng Kung Uni University in Taiwan. In yesterday's session on EV policies and regulations, um, there was a wide discussion on various uh, policy instruments to generate demand and supply for EVs. Um, India's case highlights the government's effort to decarbonize transport and regulatory measures to do, uh, by different ministries. Um, and also there was a presentation uh, on policies for E2 or three wheelers for Asia. Um, and, and also uh, they, uh, it was also discussed uh, the policy guideline for ASEAN. Uh, there was also discussion or case examples on EV targets and policies for Korea, uh, South Korea, uh, China, India. Uh, that was a focus uh, on the second half of the, of the session and supporting policies on e-bus deployment. Um, as I said, uh, those presentations and videos would be available uh, later in the solution service slide. Please don't forget to uh, check that later on if you haven't joined it yesterday. Um, to begin with, uh, to understand who are joining today's session, could you please answer to the question um, on which stakeholders group you belong to? Perfect. So as you can see, uh, we have a lot of participants from academia, uh, NGOs, and then uh, private sector, and also uh, like some representative from local government and national government. So without further delay, I will start uh, get going with the first presentation by Harm Vekin uh, from Fear Automotive. Um, he has uh, over 30 years of experience uh, in the automotive industry and his field of interest includes incentives for electric driving in Europe and support policy framework at various level of governance in Europe and the US. Good morning, everybody, or the good afternoon, depending on which region you, uh, you are. Um, yeah, I'm a managing partner of Fiera Automotive, uh, a Dutch uh, business development consulting company on electric mobility. Uh, what I'm going to do is to give you some snapshots, some quick, uh, uh, some slides uh, as an appetizer into the the topic of, of uh, the charging infrastructure and the relation, of course, with the uptake of uh, e-mobility. Uh, just some highlights. I uh, would like to, uh, to, uh, to invite you also uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to discuss more in detail uh, the, the approaches on charging. Uh, we, we work with quite a lot of cities and national governments, but also with you, European Commission on charging infrastructure, also involved in discussions around the current uh, regulation of the European Commission, so quite uh, quite uh, in, uh, into the topic. Uh, happy to go with the cities. Uh, I saw there are some local authorities in the, in the room, uh, with national authorities, but also with the institutes, the academia, who often work with the, uh, with the uh, local authorities to, uh, to go further in detail about this. Now, uh, quickly, the uh, overview. Uh, quick some slides about the importance, open doors, then something about typologies, then standards, interoperabilities, and something about the planning process. Um, and there are many other topics where we can dive into, but not today. Uh, well, yes, it's a little bit open door. Of course, you need the electricity to get the vehicle moving. So it has to be, the charges have to be available uh, throughout the country, throughout the city. Uh, it has to be the right charging speed, and, and, uh, and so that's the one, one side, and of course the user interaction and satisfaction is extremely important, so it has to be reliable, it has to be user friendly. This might seem see like buzzwords, uh, words, open doors, but it's really extremely important, and we see that in the first steps of electric mobility, 
Here, often mistakes are made, very, very many. For, uh, of course, obvious, the charging speed, if you are standing somewhere for 10 hours where you only have one hour, it's no use. Uh, also, you need to reach it. So, and it's not theoretic calculations about how many. It's also about that there should be certainty for the user to be able to charge. And by the way, this this discount for both fleets, commercial fleets, heavy duty fleets, as well as for uh, passenger uh, cars. But the reliability. So it has always needs to work. So not it's a uptime of 90% or 95%. It has to always work. It has to always interact with your vehicle, with your charging car, and it has to be very user friendly. Uh, so without hassle. Uh, from those who, who are already experienced electric mobility, they know that user friendliness is a real hurdle often. I will show some examples later on. But also the business case, because we saw too, too many times that the calculation of the charges is done bottom up from the infrastructure investments. But in the end, it has to be um, supportive for the business case for e-mobility. So this is a very important element. So the, the electricity has, has to be cheap, uh, cheaper than, the, than driving the, the petrol or diesel. Um, yeah, uh, if we look at the major uh, concerns, um, and I, I can only see part of the slide because the, 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 the participants uh, list is over it, but uh, so um, what we see that, that the concerns of the EV drivers in uh, studies that have been done with McKinsey, but also our own studies uh, and, uh, and, uh, and show this, is that the, the, uh, the driver is moving, the, so the, the concerns are moving away from is the vehicle available, uh, uh, what is the cost of the vehicle, all those things get, get less important because they know now that it's cheaper to drive, that vehicle of that choice is there, but they see that the uh, that, uh, battery driving range, uh, certainty of uh, charging, uh, battery degradation, so everything around the charging and the battery uh, is getting more important over the, over the years. This is a substantial concern of the user. So if we look at the KPIs, the, uh, the critical performance uh, indicators, uh, and then we see that, uh, in, uh, that one of the, uh, the, yeah, the, the main elements are in the, to ensure sufficient coverage, uh, um, that, that there are low, that there are enough charges, but also uh, that there are, of course, can be found and that they are registered, the very important uh, ones. That it's very important uh, that, that it happens. Um, and there are in Europe all kinds of ways to, to enforce by the European Commission the countries to have enough uh, spread of uh, charges. Can be done per capita, per kilometer, can be done, done by, uh, by density of, uh, of population, it can be done by electric vehicles registered in the country. Uh, so, and of course, with fast charging on highways, it can be done in a way that you can charge every let's say 50, 60 kilometers discussion now at the European Commission. Uh, but of course, at that location have to be enough charges so you don't, that you're not, not queuing because you already have to wait a little bit for the car is full, so you don't want to queue. But also uh, seamless uh, charges, so cross-border, being able to pay with one app, one card, with one payment instrument, whatever, has to be seamless, straightforward, without difficult registration processes. Uh, no anti-competition, no customer lock-in, not uh, competition lock-out elements that we see a lot in Europe currently. So it's important that that uh, that, uh, that uh, not to make the same mistake. Now payment has to be easy and uh, can uh, facilities. When we speak about uh, about fast charging along the highways, where you have to wait maybe 20 minutes, it's nice that you can also eat, drink, and go to the toilet. Um, uh, yeah, looking into the different uh, uh, charging typologies, and this is something where we could speak an hour about, so we're not going to do that all more than now. Uh, but just some some uh, some some uh, some highlights. Uh, of course, you can all uh, yeah you, you you know all the uh, the situations like uh, when we speak about passenger cars, we see uh, home charging. Uh, are you living in a high-rise building? It's different. And if you have your own drive lane, it's much more easy to uh, to realize. Uh, is it uh, uh, so as a city? It's also a, a nice challenge if you have a lot of uh, people with the cars on the street being parked or in the park houses. Then there's different uh, challenges than when everybody has a nice uh, a nice home with a drive lane. 
uh, if we uh, look at the uh, so recharging at the highway, it has to be fast, it has to be convenient. Recharging at work, other demands can be slower, it can be and often the smart charging it is extremely important. So different versions uh, for uh, for charging when you are using the uh, when for private vehicles. Um, and this is also where normally the discussion focuses at. And then we come to the next one. So we look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the commercial fleets uh, recharging. We see the taxi fleets, fast throughput, not have to wait, be able to, uh, uh, to maybe have an advantage when you charge. Like if you go to Amsterdam, you will see that uh, taxis uh, can go uh, in front of the queue or, or as soon as they have, uh, have ch a charged their system, the charges that is at the waiting location. Um, uh, high speed truck uh, charging, so really high powers working towards three megawatts in, the, in, in the Europe, for example, at the moment. Um, uh, opportunity charging for logistics, for example, so uh, uh, if you have long, long haulage, uh, but also you want to have it if you have uh, logistics, regional transport in the, in the integrated in the logistics systems. Um, yeah, when you were in the city distribution center, so uh, charging when you uh, when you load and un uh, unload the vehicle, for example, waste collection completely other ball game, completely other demand. Uh, buses, uh, combination of opportunities, uh, depot charging. So lots of different systems, and that's we looked at very carefully. We made an overview, but I will not go into detail for the charging profiles, typologies for. Uh, for uh, for the private vehicle charging, so like uh, charging in the parking garages, for example, at daytime, or, but you can also, if you look at nighttime, or parking uh, garages, uh, different demands, but also there are different demands from the technology. How are you going to get the power into an existing building uh, without too much cost? And uh, how do you charge in a way that's smart? Maybe you can use it. the batteries of the different vehicles when the, that vehicle to get or opportunities uh, to, to, to charge from one vehicle into the other, even maybe. You can make all kinds of range arrangements, but charging, for example, in parking garages is when you're not, when it's not prepared for it, it's not easy to arrange. So you have to think ahead. So it's a charging pattern, different at daytime, different when you are uh, somewhere eating uh, at a restaurant or something, you have different, uh, different demands. The speed is different, the business model is different. different. Um, so lots of things to, uh, to look into. Um, in line with this, I would like to, to, uh, to step towards the, the standards and interoperability. And um, let's say this is one of the biggest pitfalls. And, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I come from Europe, so I've seen all the the learning effects here, and it's 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 really important not to uh, to make the same mistakes, but to look at what can we learn from the uh, from the situation uh, that's now existing in Europe, or even what uh, improvements. It's all always improvements, and we have to for technical standards and interoperability. It's one side is technical, but it's also a commercial game between the sector. And the uh, and the users, the cities, where do the do the uh, bucks, where do the dollars, where do the euros land? Uh, at uh, uh, because at the moment, especially the first start, it's difficult to get the uh, the charging systems uh, profitable. So it's always looking at where do I uh, earn money, but it's not always in the interest of society. So as a public authority, you really have to uh, to to uh, to be very careful about how you plan your charging infrastructure, how you do your concession. So um, I understood from the former, former presentation that this was in some cases already a, a eye opener. There are of course uh, different standards uh, from, uh, in the, for, for slow charging, so the AC side here. And in North America, in Japan, that are the same, uh, the same types. And then the European uh, standard, the Manicus uh, plug, type two plug. The Chinese plug is different. For DC, it's the same, more or less the same uh, situation. So the Japanese standard being Shademo for fast charging. Um, this is important because we have learned in some of the projects in uh, Solution Plus that it's perceived that the, uh, the standards are defined by the manufacturer, but that's not the case. You as a country, you define, or as a continent, or as a and uh, the combination of countries, which, which standards you approve in your country. This is very important. Uh, and it's not only for passenger cars, but it's also for buses and trucks. Uh, we know the, uh, the, uh, 
uh, the, the examples where, for example, uh, also for the Chinese buses often, they come with their own standard. And then you are locked in. You have always, even at the manufacturer side, you have to buy the same um, uh, the bus because you only have your charging infrastructure and you don't want that. You want to enforce on the, uh, the suppliers of the vehicle suppliers, charging suppliers, your standards as a country so that you are free and that your customers, uh, most passenger cars are can uh, roam through the country easily. But this is only about roaming them for the technical side. There's much more uh, behind it. Of course, same discussions about the uh, pentagraph, not pentagraph. Uh, uh, important, I'll show in I think the next slide. Yes, so how to charge uh, buses, how to charge trucks. And this is also something to look into because the easiest way is I have here a bus. That's a diesel bus. I'm going to replace that by, uh, by an electric bus. Because it can, and I do want to do the same kilometers uh, mileage per day. So I take a bus with, with a big battery. That might be the cheapest solution for the short run. So I don't need to do that by now. Uh, 10 buses uh, and a charge overnight. But if you look at the whole city, it might be much cheaper to have a uh, lots of opportunity chargings uh, underway, uh, to have buses with smaller batteries where the infrastructure investments are very much higher, but the vehicle investments might be lower. And if you take into account logistics planning, so the number of kilometers being able to be done and the data in the per day, you might be might much better off. This is exactly when you speak to, uh, to VDL, when you speak to Volvo, when you speak to ABB, where the European industry uh, uh, differentiates, where they can really help you also with maybe not always the cheapest solution in the beginning, but all in all, in the whole system planning, the, mo the, the best and uh, ultimately also the cheapest solution all in all. So this is important. And this you can put on every case. You can put it on taxis. You can put it on, 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 uh, on, uh, on, on buses, on uh, trucks uh, situations. So look at what is the optimum, what's the sweet spot. You can also, start, of course, start to, uh, to, to lengthen the, uh, the, the trips. Um, uh, if you charge your market, Many, uh, many stakeholders uh, involved. Uh, again, we're going back now to the passenger, uh, passenger car market, I would say, because it's the, the most developed in this slide. Uh, passenger car market, energy suppliers, infrastructure, charging points, uh, the infrastructure produces the producer, the manufacturers of the charge poles, heavy duty, small ones, slow, and, uh, for heavy duty, fast charging, uh, um, uh, slow charging, so multiple ones. A uh, charge point operator, the one who owns the network. Uh, there can be also be a site host. For example, you can have your a CPO, a charge point operator, can have the char charges at a gasoline station of another brand uh, being located. Um, the, uh, what's not on the slide is the back office systems to, to, uh, to manage the whole uh, the char charge uh, network. The e-roaming, so how do you go from one to the other network so that you can use all uh, all of those uh, uh, charges in different locations different cities different highway locations so many different uh, different roles um and they need to work together and for this standardization and uh, is needed interoperability technical interoperability communication systems and communication standards so that you can with one charge patch or app or whatever is also accepted at other locations. Um, this is, uh, I believe, uh, the left one was the uh, was an example for uh, for Germany of charge cards, uh, and different cards, different logos, different providers. Um, you can see what happens. Uh, uh, on, on the right side, if you are, this is, I think, this is one of my colleagues uh, with different cards uh, being used uh, in different uh, locations driving around. Um, and this is not a this is not a joke. It's just really the case that uh, that uh, uh, if every charge point operator has his own system, and if they don't cooperate, and if they lock their block their 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 system for others, that is getting difficult. In the Netherlands. You can go around with one charge car. It doesn't have to be a car. It can be all, ways, uh, all kind of ways. Roaming is very cheap. So you all remember the, the, the telecom cost being skyrocketing in the past when you wanted to roam to another country. Within a country, you also have to roam with charge from one network 
to another network, and then you go abroad, you use other networks, and you really want to avoid that this roaming is difficult and expensive. This is what we have done in the Netherlands. Do this from the first day on when you start with electric mobility in your city and in your country and demand this from the sector. So otherwise you have to dive like the European Commission now in all kinds of regulations to repair that later on, uh, to take care that roaming is easy and cheap. Um, and of course, it's also not the easy for the sector because they just want to provide service quickly to new drivers and having to make all those agreements and contracts. But also, this has to be easy. Standard, standardization, interoperability. Uh, it starts with the technical uh, uh, standards between, for example, the vehicle and the charger need to be able to communicate. It's getting less and less, but uh, the, the number of times that it doesn't work, uh, where it, it was quite high. So that the, for example, Renault Zoe in the big early days, not communicating uh, correctly with the charger, charging going down, where there's not, not power, the Zoe stopped charging, not starting up. All those things are important. And then you're standing there, and it the, uh, doesn't charge, so you cannot continue. So you want to have this uh, working properly. The ISO standards, inter integration testing, how does it work? very important. But also then communication between the charger and the charge point operator. So uh, OSPP is the standard, I would say it's also uh, standard uh, worldwide, getting standards worldwide, very happy with that, uh, developed in, uh, in, in the Netherlands and then adopted by other countries who are uh, together are improving it all the time. Also for, for example, for charging back from the vehicle into the, into the, into the grid, same the, the standards are being uh, improved and improved. But then also the communication between the charge port operator and the one where you as a user uh, 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 buy your charge card or your whatever system from and you have want to roam with this over all the different uh, charge point networks. Uh, the communication of the data done by, for example, OCPI, but also others are around there. There is a little bit of a, uh, of a jungle with, uh, with multiple, uh, multiple standards which also makes it sometimes expensive because then you get a roaming platform that can charge fees. Um, what is interoperability in the uh, electric mobility ecosystem? It is the, uh, the, uh, and, um, the, it's the ability of vehicles, chargers, networks, and management systems to interact and manage data to ensure that you can charge safe. Well, that's open the door, so you don't, <laughs> you're not electrocuted, you electrof electrified yourself. Um, uh, comp the compatibility of equipment and protocols, it has to be functional, it has to work easy, it has to be reliable, always work, uh, system has to be up, uh, available. And you can see here all the actors again, so uh, from the vehicle, power supply, apply, energy management, uh, yeah, you can see it on the slide. Um, then something where uh, we, we, we don't have much time for now, but this is uh, something that we can uh, be happy to speak with uh, the local authorities, like I said, national authorities, but also with the, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the academia, the institutes about, is the city planning of the, uh, of the charging network. So um, uh, we worked with, uh, with a number of, of cities uh, on how to plan the uh, charging infrastructure. Um, where you look at uh, the different levels of uh, of uh, of uh, what you can include in the in the uh, in, in the mapping to define the charges. For example, looking at the, the grid, what's the power supply? Looking at the the flows, the patterns, where do people move? Where do they drive to? Where do the uh, where do they, uh, is it for, from from home to work outside the city? Is it from outside the city? To certain uh, and, uh, shopping malls areas or uh, and, uh, entertainment areas, so the different uh, locations that you want to know that you also have to know where the big flows go through the city, so maybe you can connect, connect some things. Um, you want to know where the charges are currently, how are they used, is it heavy used, is it, uh, do you need new, new ones, how far do people have to walk when they, when they are living in a certain area, so, uh, so that they can, can charge easily, are there parking uh, spaces that are not utilized at night, so all those things you want to have and you want to start for, for proper planning. It's not all um, deep technologies analyzes, it's also common sense. So uh, uh, 
looking at uh, how Oslo did that in the, in, the begin, in the early days, it was really very common sense. Looking at where are the locations, they didn't have so much power uh, issues in other cities there are, so that makes it sometimes easier. But it's also very much common sense. So looking into where would I like to have it located. Um, I involve, use the stakeholders, so hotels, uh, shopping malls. For them, it's attractive to, uh, to offer additional services. Look at by the big employers, where do they, where are they located that have, uh, are going to have and, uh, and, uh, deploy large fleets for the company cars of, the, of, the, uh, of, of their uh, uh, employees. Uh, so involve them in your planning. It's going to be expensive. Uh, this, uh, this city planning, uh, the, the realizing of the, of the charging infrastructure. So involve the stakeholders so that you can make it uh, cheaper. Uh, and of course, you can, uh, there's, always, I mean, there's always the possibility to have the private sector investing, but even then, that, uh, that costs money. So the lower it can be, uh, those costs, the better for the business case of electric mobility. Um, but also where do the, uh, the, uh, the affluent uh, people uh, with higher income levels uh, live? Uh, where you think you know, also the ones that are the, the innovators, what the earliest one uh, adopting and buying electric vehicle. Where do you expect the hotspots for electric vehicles in your city in the next, uh, in the next years? Uh, so you can plan ahead on this. You can make charging uh, in, 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 in charging locations with multiple charges uh, around uh, a local church or a local or a supermarket or whatever or in, a, in a neighborhood where you can say there's uh, and then I don't have to uh, so then I can uh, read the occupation of the charge is good not for every house uh, no. look at the grid where is the uh, the, uh, the the grid availability in the city um, Make your smart combinations, uh, like if there's already big power supply at the metro station or whatever. Look if you can connect uh, to this. Um, it's, it's making things cheaper. And the power is often not used to during the whole day on those locations, so it's also easier to for the uh, for the uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 capacity that you have to install at those locations uh, because you can have the the charging also being smart. Uh, moving with the, uh, the availability. Um, uh, evaluate with the utility company, electricity, uh, the, so the grid company in your region. Uh, and uh, I have also a next slide about this, but also look, it's important to look, start looking ahead into smart charging and vehicle to get, to get both for your renewables in the city that will flood the city at certain points with renewables. And believe me, it's happening in some cities in the Netherlands. Uh, so especially in other countries, but more of a sunshine it will also happen, uh, depending on the quality of your grid. And on the other hand, the car is starting to charge uh, locations where you don't have the power. But you can balance that. You can use the, uh, the uh, let me see, that's the next slide, I think. Oh, no, that's, the, that's the, the one after I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but also making smart combinations in city hubs. So uh, look at where you can co-locate uh, charging locations public transport, with passenger cars, urban trucks. Uh, so look at where, where is the most logical, logical location to, uh, to combine. Uh, and also look at uh, horses for courses, so very, uh, very uh, dedicated solutions. Uh, uh, yeah, if you look at what the, when many of the cities were working in a solution plus, uh, it seems that, uh, that the, for, for uh, swapping systems, for scooters, uh, uh, for e tuk tuks it's, uh, it's much more an open door than for example installing the charging locations, but you can use the, the, uh, the storage centers where you can do the swapping. Also, you can integrate that in those, in those hubs, for example, and uh, you can use them again also for smart charging if you have enough, uh, enough uh, batteries for e-scooters. It's just a numbers uh, game. How many are there? How much is available? Smart charging, even uh, charging back into the uh, grid, There's, uh, loading back electricity into the grid. Um, let me see. Oh, let's see. Yeah. So this is then uh, so a multiple layered map where different, uh, different all the systems come together and when you where you can start to, to do the planning for your charging forward. Um, as a city, think ahead. Think ahead about what you want as data. This is just an example of a monitoring system. I don't think the private sector will solve this. Uh, as a city, you want to be in control about what 
uh, where the charges are, what, or how are they used, where do you need to, uh, to, uh, to expand. It is also connected to your mobility planning, where you want to have the cars, where you don't want to have them. So it's really, it's your city, it's the city of the inhabitants, so it's your data. Do this at, from the start, because otherwise you get the situation like in the US in the beginning, where you have four charges next to each other, with four batches, four different uh, uh, providers, and depending on which subscription you have, you can use one of the cards. Who's going to pay? Society. Because you need the grid installed at the moment when there's peak, uh, the, and when there's peak demand. Uh, you can make arrange, arrangements with those charge point uh, uh, operators about who, uh, about being able to do smart charging over the system. They will, they will ask money for that. So you're in control. You're the one who makes the rules. It's your society. It's so society that pays in the end. Um, so having a good data, uh, being in control, uh, demanding that data already in the contract is very important. Come back to that in my next slide. Um, going back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the grid uh, cost, avoid uh, really uh, high investments. It's not at the moment and we start with uh, 10 charges in the city, it's not an issue. <laughs> but if it's a thousand, then that's, that's an issue. But you can use the vehicle, you can use the charger to uh, even make the uptake of renewables better. So you can store at the moment when there's a peak load of, uh, of electricity, you can store them in the vehicles. When there is not enough, and this is not uh, uh, future, far future thinking because the vehicles are coming out that are able to charge, to, to charge back into the grid, both AC, so slow charging, SDC is called, it's, uh, it's coming, it's being prepared by all manufacturers, uh, meaning that you can start to also load back into the grid when there is, when all the microwaves and all the cooking and all the, uh, the, the heating, the heat pumps or the echoes go uh, in parallel are, are starting. So there is the option to avoid high grid, grid costs, very important because the highest investment in electric mobility, far higher than the infrastructure itself. Uh, uh, lowering the energy costs, we make use of the low uh, rates uh, during the day, and there's a flooding of, uh, of uh, renewables on, on your grid. Uh, less CO2 emissions, because you can store it, you don't have to, to, uh, to stop windmills from working, which, uh, because that's too much, you can store it in the vehicles, and less dependence on fossil fuels uh, in this case. So very important. Um, yeah, public procurement is a very powerful full tool. I already am, uh, and explained the importance of, uh, of, uh, of uh, setting the right uh, demands when you roll out your charging system in your, in your system, to, uh, in, your, in your city, uh, together with, uh, with, with Polis, uh, also Solution Plus partners, uh, with TNO, also in Solution Plus. Um, we have uh, done in our project uh, in, the, in, the, in the work that we do for the European Commission on the, uh, on the EA for portals, the European Alternative Fuels uh, Observatory. Please take a look, you'll find lots of interesting data. We have done uh, a handbook on how cities can go, uh, how they can uh, do the public procurement, how they can charge. Um, and how they can uh, install, how they can install uh, and uh, attract uh, the companies to install charges in the cities. Um, public procurement is one of the most powerful tools. More, I would say, more powerful even than regulation and legislation. But in the public procurement, you define as a city who's going to uh, install uh, charges, operate charges, and under what conditions. So the interoperability is very important. Seamless charging. Uh, in city level, of course, also on net, national level, but also the a positive business case for electric mobility users for CPOs and society. So you define there, for example, what kind of access you have to the charges, both on data, but also on smart charging. You define what kind of maximum pricing uh, can be into it. You can ask for the lowest price. You can do all kinds of things. Uh, but think ahead. And this is something we really, from the Solution Plus project, we have time available. Happy to work with you uh, and set out these uh, demands. The handbook is there. Happy to go uh, through with it uh, in, in detail. Thank you uh, for the attention. I Thank you very much, Harm. Harm. Um, so I think you have given a holistic overview of charging infrastructure. It is very interesting that you mentioned about the EV users' perspective uh, for the for developing charging in a system. 
the integrated approach to, uh, working together with various stakeholders on energy infrastructure and services and also to uh, formulate the protocols um, which is an important aspect in charging infrastructure planning. The first question is from Gaurav Raj Pandey. So he was asking uh, how was single payment gateway enabled in Netherlands and how did they bring the stakeholders together. Another question together with him was, uh, in one of the slides you mentioned, or you, you put this red dot. So what are the red dots about? Maybe it's the charging spots and how these points are determined. Now first, the, the, how did the Netherlands do that? Um, the background is that the Netherlands started very much from the utility companies, electricity, uh, so the, the grid operators, started uh, with, uh, with the rolling out the charging infrastructure and gradually more and more uh, commercial actors uh, joined. Um, under clear leadership of, of this, uh, this, uh, this grid uh, and, uh, operators, but also a national platform where uh, industry, industry, industry representatives, uh, government uh, institutes are making the plannings for electric mobility. Uh, under this leadership, uh, under this, this, this guidance, it is uh, a roaming, a very, uh, uh, very hands-on, uh, low-cost system for uh, uh, for balancing the, the cost between for balancing the payments between the different actors was uh, was started, um, and at a certain point there was no discussion anymore. So, like you saw that the discussion in Germany there was there, that was not there in the Netherlands because. If everybody can roam freely through a country and the payment is, uh, is, is easy, for example, and then also the utilization of the charges gets up. So everybody wins. And uh, with this starting point, so we never had a situation where we had to bring together 10 competing, fighting CPOs or whatever number. So we started from a, a joint vision where the commercial actors were tapped along and stepped into a, a system where they, they understand. And we can see now in Europe, uh, there is regulation coming up, um, a new regulation coming up, the, uh, the, uh, the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation. And we can see that, that also from the private sector, uh, and especially from the Dutch side, but also surrounding countries, they are demanding the same uh, the same things. So they, they want to have it easy, the roaming, they want to have they want to have the complexity, they want to avoid uh, competition being locked out. Because they see ultimately they're profiting. In the beginning it's easy, they think if you just to, if I close my network, uh, they won't go to others and uh, I can tie them in. But later on they see it doesn't work that way. So we so you have to understand the Dutch situation what started very early. <laughs> so let's say uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, and from the angle of the, of the, the, uh, the, the public uh, interest, and then the, uh, the commercial sector very well understood that they benefit as well. Happy to go more in detail and to see how we can do that uh, with, uh, with, uh, with your country and, uh, and region. Uh, the red dots, uh, yeah, there are different colors uh, for uh, over... Um, uh, for charges not being uh, um, uh, being used, uh, for charges being uh, sometimes the beginning there were charges out of operation, so a charger was located, but then the, the inhabitant was uh, moved out of the city, uh, uh, and uh, the charger was never uh, never uh, connected. So that can it also happen. So, uh, but also the over uh, the, the 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 overuse, so that, that we see that's not enough. So with are different colors. Uh, for, the, for the charges that need to be located and uh, also happy to go more in detail in, in this. Yeah. yeah, there's another question I saw, Schietu, that is, uh, yeah, the, 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 the flooding, that's a nice technical question. <laughs> and <laughs> it's depending on how you, uh, you look at it. Uh, the, I don't know what you mean with flooding, if it's uh, topped over the vehicle, well, you know, that also, uh, also, uh, the, Petrol cars don't survive that uh, too well. They 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 
try for the they threw it away. You have seen that all recently in the also in, the, in my country and other countries in that's why you like in Germany. But uh, the electricity and the battery, uh, I think also there are the Tinos in the in the room today, uh, I believe, uh, Skitu. Uh, it's not it's not so much of an issue. It is uh, it's not so that if you're going uh, for, uh, through rain and if you drive through uh, and, and uh, through uh, some water that that you really have a problem with. The, uh, with the electric vehicle that's bigger than with other uh, with uh, with uh, petrol cars it's not an it's not not really an issue uh, and we also have flooding of course in, uh, in europe but uh, i'm not sure where you come from uh, but uh, probably less than you have uh, i would like to leave the question to the, techn the, the technicians the the, the, uh, the experts but i it's not uh, it's not uh, not an issue like it's 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 the same like with the degradation there's all the, oh, the battery will degrade yeah in the beginning there were some problems and of course there are it's not so that it goes on forever but it's not it's 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 more of a of a discussion that has been growed uh, have been growing and growing but that's not really uh, the case so you can happily drive with it 10 years without uh, the battery uh, de degradating too much. In the beginning, Nissan Leafs was terrible, the first battery. Uh, but now all those uh, batteries yeah. are my better and better. Then there was another one. What should um, be the proportion of charging station stations? That's a nice one because this is um, depending uh, on uh, who, the local situation. If you are in a, uh, in a city, with uh, um, uh, all, uh, all uh, buildings where people can only park at the street um, uh, or in uh, parking garages and they have to uh, charge overnight, for example, when they commute in and out of the city to their work, <laughs> then you, you can always, you always go to factor one by one. But there are also situations like in the US where they rely more on on the same model like with petrol, where you go to charging uh, for fast charging and where you don't uh, have your car charged overnight. I have to say, but coming from the European perspective, the big advantage of electric vehicle is that you plug it in, you don't need so much power, even if you have enough hours. And on average, your car doesn't do hundreds of uh, kilometers a day. So you can, uh, and, uh, you, you can relatively easy charge your vehicle at night. And in the morning it's full again, or 80%, because the battery stays even longer if you don't go to 100%. So, in the, so you charge and you don't have the, the hassle anymore. And that's the beauty of electric driving. So having enough of charging infrastructure is important. Uh, uh, the numbers, uh, it's really depending on the composition of the city. So uh, uh, if you if you would, would say, uh, for example, now the, the guidelines for you being commissioned uh, uh, go to, uh, one, to one in five as a minimum, uh, that would in the Netherlands be far too uh, low because we have, a, we have a lot of people living in the big cities that don't have access to their own uh, drive lane, so they cannot install the, ch the charger there. So it's depending on the country. Uh, the calculation can be can be made for this. It's country, but also for if you have a city neighborhood that that has uh, where the houses are bigger, you might not have to worry at all so much. But you want to do something at the supermarkets because other come in uh, supermarkets in this area because other visitors come in and want to charge where they are maybe not, uh, uh, where they cannot charge at somebody else's home, for example. So it is there you might do some other things than where you have a packed area uh, where, you, uh, where, you, where you don't have, uh, where the people don't have this possibility. Thank you, Har. Thank you so much. Uh, so our next presenter is uh, Jyoti Prasad uh, Panuli. Uh, he's a senior energy planner and a senior researcher at Technical Un University of Denmark, or DTU. Uh, he's actively working on areas of variable energy sources, alternative energy, energy efficiency, and technology. Um, he's going to present on charging infrastructure policy framework. Uh, so, Jyoti, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Shetu. Actually, my presentation is on this particular, specifically on this uh, policy advice paper, EV charging infrastructure. This is based on the suggestion from the organizers. This is a policy advisory paper on which solution plus partners, several partners have been working on. So this is uh, one of the partners actually is FIA who just made the presentation. So. Uh, and, and as a lot of this is already in this paper also. So I would be skipping the things which have been already presented. 
and uh, covering uh, other things which are not uh, probably covered by other partners in this in this because they, these are the very lot of partners as you can see that idiada has contributed fia has contributed you you me has university you know, has contributed and unap has contributed and uh, of course, DTU from DTU side, I work with the UNEP DTU partnership. And so we have also contributed to this paper. There are five chapters in this uh, report, actually report. I'll uh, skip the introduction and uh, more of background. But actually in this chapter also, there is a lot of info, technical information about EV charging and then uh, barriers to deployment of EV charging infrastructure. So I'll be, going through some of, focusing on these uh, issues, technical issues and barriers, which are not explained in detail so far. And then there are the charger types uh, like, uh, and the, you know, battery swapping, open standards, interoperability, grid management issues. Some of these already have been covered by my previous speaker, Hakim, from FIA. And then policies to overcome barriers. And this is also based on um, the, a lot of uh, our experience also in other projects where like we are working with Zimbabwe, we are working with Ghana and, and, and other countries and India and all that. Then identification of charging needs. In this uh, very briefly one slide, I'll be covering on forecasting ch uh, charging demand and location of charging points. And you, know, you have a lot of criteria for that. There are contractual models, and one of which um, uh, Hakim mentioned about public procurement, and which is one of the very important. But again, this is an area where there will be probably more presentations, so I would uh, not be covering this. And then very briefly, I'll let you also know that what kind of final strategy the partners put together have put for the, you know, for the Tegari. So now uh, uh, in Kigali, actually, there is a so-called demonstration action is uh, covers these four areas. And uh, all these uh, current uh, you know, issues and recommendation and uh, barriers mostly you know, relate to these uh, areas. One is that electric share bicycles, electric motorcycles, electric buses, and then finally, that how do you integrate this electric mobility with all these uh, new e vehicles coming in the current uh, transport? So these are the way, these are the primarily four uh, uh, areas which are being covered in the Kigali demonstration because Solution Plus has uh, intensity. So Kigali is just one of these cities there. This one unfortunately has been again in detail presented by Hakim, my previous uh, speaker here, that ensures sufficient coverage of recharging infrastructure, ensures seamless charging with consumer-centric focus, ensure reliable and easily accessible payment method. So obviously I don't have to go through this. I'm simply mentioning that these are the requirements uh, you know, from a, for, from a charging infrastructure and you know now very well what this means from the previous presentation. So what I'll come to the next is that if these are the requirements, what are actually the issues? What are the kind of uh, the barriers and all that, that that the countries could face from these, uh, for these to fulfill these requirements? And these barriers basically come from, uh, from where do they come actually? They come that is several several countries there have been the, now these studies on barriers, and uh, this is kind of you can say a, a, a synthesis of these kind of uh, issues that the various countries are facing at different stages of the development of electric mobility. So the in this series of these barriers, the one of the foremost and most important barrier, you know, are you know like uh, I mean it's not that. The barrier is one or two. All barriers are extremely important for mobility to take forward. But you know the countries will move forward. The first two barriers, for example, the economic and financial barriers and technical barriers, they really are at the heart of the you, you can say the uh, mobility issues to, to take them forward. And you know you can see, for example, you know if you go with the cost, for example, it's just given from. 2019 figures, 
and I think this was also contributed by, contributed in the paper by FIA. So the label was charger in 2019 would cost around $813 per charger. And this is just for 1.2 to 1.4 kilowatt. And this is level of charger, where do you put this? You put it maybe in home, you can, or maybe in offices and all that. And the charging time for this can be as high as, you know, like eight hours, 10 hours, overnight charging kind of thing. Then you go to level two charger, and then, you know, like where the cost increases, the, uh, the, the you know, your kilowatt increases and your uh, charger per cost as a result also increases. And then if you go finally to the fast charging, which is needed on like in highways and all those kind of places where they, you don't want to spend much time, then the cost for buses, for example, for fast charging can be as high as $140,000 per charger. So this becomes a very important issue that how do you really you know, address this issue of cost? One of the things, of course, it needs a lot of uh, issue it has to do with demand that how much is demand, uh, you know, and, and so that the cost also can be, uh, you know, amortized over a number of consumers and so that, you know, you have per head co cost comes down. It becomes a kind of chicken and uh, egg issue here. And uh, there are ways, of course, to deal with this uh, and uh, that will come to the second stage of the, basically the measures. Then technical barriers, these again have been discussed quite in detail. So probably again, I don't um, have to mention too many of these, except I'll just very briefly mention the one which are, which are, uh, you know, you can say that not uh, that much covered. Multiple charging and battery standards, you saw that, you know, what it, what it can do to basically, you know, to the consumers that if there are too many standards then you know, you are really confused and one, one thing cannot work at other place and uh, so on and things like that. Building codes and technical standards, you know, you need uh, in for home charging that the buildings have those facilities and one needs the building codes for that space. So in the new construction, you need to have those codes. Currently, this is a new technology. These are the kind of things where the new technology would always have, a lack of skilled personnel. So it may not be that difficult basically to provide, uh, you know, make the uh, skilled, but then it needs a proper training program at the in a country level. Scaling up, when, when this uh, deployment is scaled up, and you so just saw that, you know, that there will be tremendous increase in the electricity demand. Now there would be other many ways to actually address that issue, but in in any case you might need a grid upgradation because you know your demand over or demand has increased uh, and uh, you know these this grid upgradation can be a, a also a quite an expensive issue. It, the cost involved can be very high there. New technologies are uh, emerging every day, and uh, so there that can be also you know and for example now you know there is this uh, vehicle to grid technology when you are trying to integrate uh, renewable in the grid then it can be one of the very uh, the good technology in terms of you know providing you uh, a storage itself in the cars you know when vehicle to grid so the vehicle actually can vehicles battery can actually act as a kind of a storage so these are the very new technology in the stage of a pilot stage right now there can be multiple uh, infrastructure uh, uh, requirements. So, you know, for the various kind of infrastructure, you know, somebody also mentioned that what is what is better battery swapping. So it is not actually directly a question of uh, better and all that. It it it's that at some stage for some kind of mobility you can think of uh, battery swapping, but it requires a different infrastructure. Similarly for your normal, uh, going through this normal uh, current technology of charging, then it requires a different technology. So what kind of infrastructure you are to, going to build up for what kind of vehicles you are going to build up? This becomes an issue which needs to be decided at. And you can see that in some countries, the battery swapping has been working very well. And I know, for example, in India, this has picked up a lot. And uh, there can be even issues in uh, basically, you know, in countries where we are working in Ghana and for example, Zimbabwe, that 
people actually want to retrofit their existing cars they wouldn't want to buy in uh, you know the new 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 electric vehicle so how, what are the cost involved in that what are the kind of technologies involved to do that and those are the kind of things which will uh, also determine a lot of this uh, deployment and what happens is that once you have select a particular technology, there is always, you know, technology lock-in. It, its life is 10 years or 20 years, and you have spent so much of money on this that you, it becomes a lock-in. So it is important that these barriers are removed and the proper technology is selected. Uh, related to that is, you know, like there are these policy and regulatory barriers in practically countries, you know. If, for example, if there is a no standards then there is a market fragmentation a market so there are different kind of uh, standard different people can uh, only do go to it only specific stations and only you know charge there then the, there is a market fragmentation there is not enough demand so the infrastructure cannot be built up so regulation uh, on standards can be handy on that that you know a country issues a standard then the, the demand you know can be can pick up uh, on the, much faster than if you have no standards there. So it becomes very important to have that regulation. The role of utilities, as you saw, that uh, the electricity is one of the very important factor for charging. And so utilities, uh, what role they will have? Will the uh, in some countries it's also being explored that utilities could actually themselves set up these uh, kind of uh, charging stations, or whether it is going to be some other private investors who are going to do. So these rules uh, with the, and the distribution companies will can be unique to the country, but they will need to be resolved. Price of electricity is another factor because uh, in many countries, the electricity prices are very high and the electric mobility, in spite of you know, giving other, uh, other incentives, it may not be that uh, you can, uh, it can be viable. Information and awareness barriers, actually, you know, it looks simple, but it has emerged one of the major barriers in many countries. Even the government support policies, policies for example, are really not uh, known to the, to the public. Uh, I'll not go through these because this, uh, the technical issues have been covered by a colleague that, uh, you know, what kind of charger, there are a variety of chargers there whether you want slow or fast, and then you have these criteria, cost of charger, type of uh, e-mobility it is, cost of system. So these kind of uh, criteria are can be used to select a charger. This again has been discussed quite well in detail, so I don't have to go through this. What kind of standards? And you can see that there are several standards which have emerged. I'll simply mention that, you know, for example, this now a new standard uh, on which uh, China and Japan are working, it uh, started working in 2020. They want to make it uh, by 2035 international standard. So it can be very long process, you know, in some cases to for international um, standard to evolve. Interoperability issue again has been covered by Hakim. So my life is made much easier by doing that. That you know that interoperability refers primarily to a lot of communication between various charger uh, infrastructure components. So again, I don't have to really go through this, uh, except uh, saying that you know that um, the that if this issue is not taken into consideration, the assets on which you have put so much investment in the country can be obsolete in no time. This again has been uh, actually this uh, uh, figure issue sees from this paper is the same one FIA has contributed there. And this they have already, uh, already explained that what it, uh, you know, how much the smart charging can, for example, can contribute to your flattening of this peak curve because the peak electricity providing can be very expensive proposition. So this is a grid management becomes a very important technical issue. Battery surfing, as I said, you know, it can be very pop, it's very popular, where particularly for two and three wheelers where the batteries are not that heavy. It can be an issue, of course, you can have a robot to change the battery in uh, those charging station, but then your infrastructure can be totally different requirements. So this is uh, something on which uh, primarily the most of the countries where uh, it's for two and three wheelers, it is being actually preferred for that kind of. Uh, 
policies for addressing these barriers i along with the barriers i already discussed i'll very briefly mention that you know like economic and financial barrier there are variety of these policies many countries are using subsidies, incentives, reduce or no parking fees, electric, ro, reduce electricity rates, low lease or rental price for establishing charging sites. And, you know, it's not need not to be everything, but it needs to be a combination of this. And the basic principle is that the electric mobility with after these subsidies and the taxes and rebates should become competitive with your existing, um, you know, um, the fossil fuel based uh, transportation unless it is competitive you obviously it cannot pick up so the so for example you might need to calculate the, uh, the total cost of ownership for the uh, vehicle owners and then put these rebates and incentives in a way that the co total cost of ownership is favorable for electric vehicles compared to for example you know to the, the to the additional vehicles and that's only uh, then only of course you will have a need for the charging station so this is kind of a mutually reinforcing areas where you know you have you may need to provide these subsidy incentives either to the charging charging stations as well as uh, for the vehicle owners so technical barriers as i mentioned that uh, along with the barrier description so i don't have to go into detail with this um, one of the things with only which I will mention is that it is very important, you know, policies which have been helped in promoting, you know, electric mobility and therefore the charging facilities that you can have low emission zones, for example, and that um, uh, where, where you then through providing public charging facilities, you know, this kind of uh, requirements can be met. You can have also, you know, in the, your, uh, transportation plans which are now also sometime you know you refer the sustainable urban mobility plan is specifically for the transport ev charging structure can be an uh, integral component of that so dealing you know as a part of the overall plan can really help the, the build, building of the infrastructure quite fast for awareness again there are well-known uh, measures like demonstration pilots awareness campaigns and of course uh, EV champions, it can be celebrities and other who like uh, to promote these kind of uh, mobility, which will help promote the charging. I think uh, uh, just uh, just uh, forecasting charging demand. Uh, it is important, uh, you know, because you how you decide where you will put up charging stations. So for that, and there are a variety of models available for that. Again, this was uh, discussed, so I don't want to go into detail in this. Charging location also has been covered, home charging, workplace charging, published charging by my previous colleagues. So where you put what kind of charging station is a function of that. This is covered in our paper, but uh, now you have had presentation on this, so I don't want to go through this. Uh, one of the things which I think uh, finally I just wanted to mention is that in your barrier analysis and policy measures, one of the very important component is stakeholder consultation. Even when you decide what you need to, what where you want to go for, whether you are you know, establishing a strapping station or where you want to do the two-wheeler or three-wheeler or whatever it is, stakeholder consultation are extremely important because any measures you take, you know, later on you see, but this is not working. It is because the uh, appropriate stakeholders have not been consulted. So this is one of the most important uh, measure, in my opinion, when you are doing any kind of barrier analysis or going for the policy measures that you make a list of all important stakeholders and involve them meaningfully. And, and actually they should be the one who come out with these various policy measures so that uh, they are then success. They take ownership of that and it becomes successful. I think uh, I also in this paper, there are two examples of uh, China and India. They are just for your reference, so I don't want to go through that. I think I've already taken uh, the, the time which was there allocated. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll be available for the questions later. Thanks. Can we use DC fast charger to charge all type of vehicles and how can 
this be standard, uh, how can standardizing charging stations for all type of vehicle can be developed? Uh, uh, um, like, yeah. yeah, no, I think it's more of a question for uh, my colleague from FIA to uh, answer, but there are, there are fast charger for all kind of vehicles and there are slow charger for all kind of vehicles. Now, obviously, you know, you wouldn't use a 350 kilowatt uh, charger, you know, at, at, at a cost of 140,000, you know, for charging a, for example, a two wheeler and all that. So that suitability will definitely vary across, you know, the, the, the charger. But, and uh, maybe actually, you know, this question is taken and, and by, you know, my colleagues from uh, uh, FIA and others who are working on these uh, kind of technical issues. Thanks. So our next presenter is uh, Bart van der Poel from TNO, Netherlands. Uh, he's a team lead uh, for the urban strategy team and he's, he's developing and, and implementing the urban strategy toolbox in cities worldwide. Uh, so he's also discussing a part of the toolbox de development. Uh, so um, uh, Bart, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, my name is Bart van der Poel. I am a uh, project manager and team lead for our strategy team at TNO. And I'm going to talk about, well, holistic fact-based planning and operation of zero emission buses in an urban environment, which is a very long and a slightly vague title, but I will explain later what it means. Um, so first a short, um, Introduction for people who don't know, I'm from TNO, which is uh, the Netherlands' largest applied research organization. Uh, we were established by law in uh, 1932. And we basically, our goal is to bridge the gap between the academia and the, and the industry. So we basically, we are an organization that uh, tries to make science applic applicable for society. Um, so we are on our mission to connect basically people and knowledge and to create innovation for um, to boost the competitive strength of the industry and society uh, and well-being of society basically we are in a, we are founded by law and we are an independent organization and not for profit organization um, so basically that means there's a law that says that TNO exists but we are not a government organization we do a lot of research also for the government. And we do that with well, over more than uh, 3000 uh, scientists and uh, also a lot of other people that are uh, involved. So I'm not sure if these presentations all will be shared, but there are some links below that I can, uh, that you can click to learn a little bit more. Um, Tino's has nine units. I'm from the unit traffic and transport. So basically we are uh, mostly about uh, smart and sustainable mobility. And uh, um, well, basically when we talk about smart and sustainable mobility, we talk about safe and efficient, sustainable and comfortable traffic and transport uh, by balancing the interactions between the humans, the vehicles and the environment. So basically we have a um, we have two integrated roadmap roadmaps that are uh, one uh, roadmap is called uh, sustainable and one's roadmap is called smart um, and they both uh, apply to mobility and logistics and then we have basically we distinguish three levels with them on the at the bottom we have the uh, the vehicle level uh, on top of that we have the mobility and uh, um, logistics so basically the system level and then on top there's the system of systems level where we talk about society um, if we're talking about um, zero emission buses then uh, we can make this a little more um, concrete um, so when we have our when we have a holistic view on zero emission buses we say we want clean, accessible, and sustainable, and a comfortable city. Um, 
And so I will take you on a, on a smart tour on a, uh, on, on a project we did in, uh, in Singapore, where we want to have, go onto the transition from uh, diesel buses, over 5,000 of them, to um, a complete electric bus fleet. And so basically what we did is uh, on the different levels, we created tools to support um, the whole process, basically. Um, so that means that we start at the, uh, at the vehicle level, then we go to the systems level, and at the end, we are going to the systems of systems level, so the, the, the city level. Um, this is more about sustainable. So on the smart side, you would have uh, like, connected and automated buses. Um, we are not, I'm not going to talk about that. We are more on the sustainable side. So uh, the integration of electric vehicles <clears throat> and the effect they would have on charging infrastructure, uh, electricity demand, things like that. All right. So when we are going to transition to, uh, to electric buses, then, um, then we have quite a few uh, things to consider. So on the, on the one hand, we have got the technology uh, part. So there are uh, many different vehicle types uh, already available, battery sizes, um, we've got chargers, uh, grid connections, everything that's uh, technically related, um, we have to put in our, uh, in our tooling and we have to work with it. Then on the other side, we have the operational level where we say, all right, there is this uh, bus schedules that need to be run, the service level, uh, people to run it, there are routes, um, there are timetables. And, and there, between the two, there can be a lot of things optimized. For, in the vehicle planning, for example, when you switch from, uh, well, everybody knows, when you switch from diesel to electric buses, um, these electric buses need to be charged and uh, charging takes time. So that will in influence your timetables and your vehicle planning and things like that. Then of course, there are the, uh, the local conditions you have to consider. So local conditions uh, are the passenger loads, uh, the cityscape, the weather, other traffic and, uh, and obviously the stakeholders, uh, manufacturers, suppliers, uh, financial institution, grid operators, operators, authorities, uh, and the passengers themselves. And also there um, can be optimization stages that we need to include. So, and to measure all this, we have to define uh, KPIs to uh, assess whether or not we are doing the right thing. So basically there we can look at uh, we can look at the costs, uh, we buy uh, an amount of buses, what will they cost? We, they, uh, they, they need electricity, what will it cost? What is the service level we want to have? How many land use uh, do we, uh, is, is needed by putting all the charging infrastructure there? Uh, what does it mean for noise, uh, for risk, for safety, pollution, things like that. So when we did this whole uh, planning thing, we built, we, we started basically at the vehicle level, uh, which is the V-Bus. So we have uh, already quite a lot of uh, electric buses, uh, existing electric buses. They all have a, a powertrain and they all have secondary auxiliary uh, services running in them. So, what we did, we created energy models for um, for the bus consumption. So the driving of the bus, the, the traction, uh, inertia, the uh, uh, resistance, uh, things like that. And then on the other hand, on the vehicle, still on the vehicle level, we also have the uh, the secondary system. So the environmental system, um, the uh, air conditioning, um, which are can be in especially in uh, in Singapore can be quite energy consuming, and then we 
take these individual buses, we put a battery in them, and then we create a fleet of those buses. So what we then put in there is the, um, we, we, we put in all the, the bus schedules and the, uh, and the routes. Uh, so, and, and we create, and, and, and the charging infrastructure, and then we created models for it, uh, where we, uh, and then we ran the simulation, we, we created all the KPIs um, on the fleet level, and then basically we can start to iterate and optimize. So, uh, for example, we have a several bus lines, we can say, all right, let's, let's try to electrify certain bus lines, what will happen? Uh, will the buses run empty? Uh, can they run? Uh, will will the, when the, when they are charging? Will there be enough charging poles at a certain location? Or, uh, can the grid handle the um, the the electricity demand? Also, the local uh, climate, the the weather during the day, the when the temperature goes up uh, and it's hot, the air conditioning will start to work harder. Is the um, is the the energy amount of the bus itself? Uh, do we need to adjust the schedule to uh, make sure it also runs during those those peak levels? Also, when there are more passengers and there's a lot of weight in there, so we created a system where we can basically iterate and optimize the whole uh, fleet. So, which is quite nice, and we actually can do a lot there yet but it's not uh really holistic because the um the fleet level optimum is basically well probably most likely not the city level optimum and uh also the optimum right now is likely not the optimum of the future so in order to make the connection between the uh, between the fleet level which is basically about simulation uh, simulating assets and schedules we also need to take a look at other domains uh, in which these buses operate uh, on the city level uh, for that we created basically uh, a, a platform a multi-domain platform uh, where we can simulate uh, where well, we can create digital city twins. Um, so uh, that means we can have a city and we can simulate several aspects of the city in different kind of models. So um, we, we basically what we do is we combine a bunch of models. Uh, one of them is the electrical bus model. We combine them with uh, models for environment, air pollution, we combine them with uh, traffic models, we combine them with um, uh, models for noise, models for uh, demand, models for electricity, uh, and, and we can combine those with uh, data, uh, city data can be real-time data, can be um, uh, uh, artificial data, can be, can be uh, bus schedules, traffic models and stuff. And then we combine those um, on a high speed uh, application that actually exchanges all this data and then let the models calculate all the uh, KPIs that we need. And then uh, uh, output them through all kinds of interfaces. So basically what we do is say, we have this multi-domain challenges we that only want to uh, um, transition to an electrical bus fleet, but we also make uh, want to make the city more livable for everyone. And we want to reduce uh, the air pollution and we want to reduce noise. And so we combine those different models into urban strategy platform, uh, use uh, fast GPU parallel computing, and um, to, to basically combine all of those models to have a, a true holistic view of the city. So how does it look for electric buses? So this is an example in Singapore 
all the dots on the side, you uh, uh, the yellow and the green dots, those are all kind of uh, those are all electric buses um, with uh, various state of charges. So uh, um, this is basically the vehicle level um, where we uh, put a uh, where we change uh, electric bus to uh, a bus to an electric bus, put a battery in it, and um, and let it drive around for all day according to a special schedule. So what you see is uh, in the in the time at the bottom there's a bar which indicates the um, the lowest charged bus, uh, where the black bar means that the buses are really uh, empty at that point. Um, and we can look at the individual buses, but we also can look at the charging infrastructure. So we can place charging infrastructure in the city. We can we can put charges there. We can define different type of chargers, and then we can uh, take a look at the power consumption of those charges. We can take a look at the occupancy of those charges. Are there enough charging poles? Are there enough parking spaces uh, on those depots? And um, so we, we created this, this, these models within our strategy platform to, um, to basically dimension the whole fleet. Uh, we can derive all kinds of KPIs from that, uh, from uh, more technical KPIs like uh, minimum state of charge, critical hours, uh, energy demand, but also financial KPIs like um, operational costs, uh, uh, TCO calculations. And then what we do is say, we've got the urban strategy platform with all the, all the uh, different kind of models. We've got uh, mobility demand, we've got traffic models, we've got micro simulation, uh, air, noise, safety, uh, energy, uh, health, electric bus. And we say, all right, we've got this electric bus simulation. Let's connect this electric bus simulation to the um, to the whole traffic system. So, what does it mean? How does the uh, the introduction of those bus lines, the, the, the whole public transport system, how does it interact with the rest of the traffic system uh, and with the demand of of uh, mobility? For example, if we say if we increase the um, has nothing to do with electrical buses, but if we increase the um, rate of the public transport, the, the frequency of the public transport, will it shift traffic to uh, public transport instead of people using cars? On the other hand, we can also say, well, if we change, go from electrical buses to, from diesel buses to electrical buses, we, it will have effect on, on the air pollution. Uh, depending on the speed might also have effect on the, on the noise levels. So we can also combine the air pollution models and the noise models with our electric bus. Sorry, Bart, uh, could you please wrap up in three minutes? Yes, I was always there. I'm almost there. Thank you. The, uh, the environmental impact, then we can calculate health KPIs from that. Um, when we talk about electrical buses, we also have uh, the effect on energy consumption. And then we have a model for solar potential. So can we create extra energy on the rooftops to, um, to provide extra energy for the charging locations? So what we do in the urban strategy platform is basically we combine all these models to a single system. So this is what we did for, uh, for example, on Curaçao, where we say, all right, we have a traffic network, we have got the air modules and the noise pollution, and then we combine it with the, uh, with the EV tooling so that we can actually start planning um, the whole transition, the, the energy transition and the mobility transition by modeling both the energy system and the mobility system, adding charging infrastructure and buses to the uh, uh, to the models, and start calculating KPIs and what are the best options.
when we are talking about these these kind of models that we can use, there are, are quite a few developments going on right now. So one thing is uh, the simulation of electrical buses, but what we really want to do is also have more uh, macro level simulations of electrical vehicles so that we can say, for example, uh, the penetration of electrical vehicle vehicles will increase. What will it mean for electricity demand in certain areas? Um, or where where are our, where do we need to put our charging infrastructure? Also, new mobility um, with self-driving cars is uh, something we are looking into right now. Public transport, multi-user class. So basically, we can split uh, the the vehicle types into different types. So electrical buses, um, electrical scooters, electrical logistics. Uh, electrical cars, traffic safety, of course, is, an, uh, is a, a, an issue where we are developing models for right now. Logistics and hubs are, um, are things we are working on. And the social inclusion, um, how accessible are all these um, services for, for people? And does everyone has access to, for, for example, public transport or charging locations? Uh, health, spatial, real-time data, and uh, our biggest um, uh, challenge is the basically optimization, where we are starting to use AI to iterate uh, solutions to come up with a um, uh, with the optimum solution. So instead of creating scenarios, we want to say to a system, what's the best scenario that we can have and how can we do that? So that's about it. Uh, I think you, if you have any questions, please let me know. So our next presenter is Arno Kekhoff. He's the global head of uh, bus division in UITP. Uh, he's a senior trainer on the worldwide basis uh, on the development of UITP training business as well. Thank you, Sritu. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and, and, and welcome everybody. Pleasure to, uh, to continue the, the round of, of lectures. I'd like to, yeah, to, to share with you uh, yeah, some of the work um, yeah, we have been doing in UITP um, from the perspective of the public transport uh, sector. So uh, it's really an association of public transport uh, based in, uh, in Brussels, actually. Um, and um, yeah, working a lot with, uh, with the operators uh, and also the, uh, the authorities and, uh, and manufacturers. And in the frame of, of Solutions Plus, we, uh, we try to, uh, to share at this occasion some uh, actually of the, uh, well, the, of the results of, of a project that we have been uh, doing, still doing, by the way, on, on Assured. And uh, I also try to gather some experiences from our uh, operating members across uh, across the planet. You could say from from Shenzhen to Moscow to Los Angeles to Paris, London, on uh, actually uh, yeah current uh, experiences with the charging uh, technology. So I I try to focus as much uh, in this presentation on the different uh, bus uh, charging technologies. And um, yeah, also share some information on the uh, interoperability uh, uh, protocol. Uh, so I heard in the previous presentations was uh, mentioned a lot, and I can add a stone to this uh, building specifically for uh, for the electric uh, electric buses. But maybe before uh, let's say diving into the uh, examples of the charging technology. Uh, I just wanted to start here with sort of lexicon uh, on uh, more on the on the terminology around uh, charging, uh, because what we what we observed is uh, in many, many cases when a, a bus fleet or when a city starts plans to electrify uh, the public transport. Yeah, there is a whole series of stakeholders uh, concerned, not only the operator, but also the town hall and the city, uh, public transport authority, uh, different, uh, I would say, actors uh, like the, the grid, uh, grid supplier industries. Uh, so it's always important to have a um, yeah, same, 
I would say level uh, the level playing field. If if, if you talk about uh, the concept, so if we are talking here about the charging technologies, um, so we will mainly uh, let's say focus and and describe uh, the different technologies uh, that uh, that are today uh, on the market for for electrification of uh, of buses. Whereas as we uh, talk about the charging strategies, it's much more an approach from the from the operator uh, on the questions on, on where uh, where to charge uh, the buses, uh, how uh, how to charge the buses. So it is linked, of course, to the technologies and also when to charge the buses during a, during a day, during an operations day, or maybe uh, during the night. So these two uh, elements, I would say, I will try to, to, to detail them further a bit in, uh, in my presentation. But maybe to start with the strategies, um, already uh, yeah, important to make this distinction between what we say opportunity charging and, uh, and depot or overnight charging, uh, where we clearly distinguish uh, also different cities, different operators that have strong preferences for uh, for strategy uh, where the buses are charged during the night. Uh, so during the non-service hours of the public transport buses, always taking place at the, at the depot uh, and where the buses are yeah, charged at slow, uh, slow speed and where the charging infrastructure is also located at the, at the depot or at the bus, bus carriage. Uh, and then the other uh, strategy uh, that is commonly, I would say, observed across different uh, also members of UITP is the opportunity charging, uh, which takes place during uh, the public tra transport services uh, during the day and during the service uh, timetable. And this can take place either on the, on the bus route uh, at the terminal, for instance, or even at the, at the stop. I will show some examples later. But it can also take place in a uh, yeah, uh, bus depot or charging hub. Huh? So the buses can, can leave the line, be opportunity charged uh, at, at the spot, and, and go back to service. So these are, I would say, uh, yeah, two, the two basic strategies uh, to, to distinguish. And I will show you um, also some examples of uh, yeah, combinations of those two strategies. Uh, what we have been focusing on in the uh, assured project, actually European uh, funded project, uh, was specifically on the high power charging uh, vehicles, heavy duty vehicles. So there's a truck part and the bus part and UITP, we are working on the coordination of, uh, of the bus part, uh, where we have been working on specifically uh, the interface and between, on the one hand, electric bus, and on the other hand, the charging, uh, the charging uh, infrastructure, and the way how those two elements uh, yeah, are interfaced together. Um, so we make here a schema of uh, four different uh, charging interfaces. On the left, uh, I suppose well known, it's the it's the plug, it's the combo two plug. So it's a manual connection. Uh, to plug, uh, well, to plug in the bus with an, with an, as an inlet, and uh, of course these plugs and those inlets they need to be uh, compatible uh, for uh, well for different buses and also for different uh, different plug uh, makes. And uh, although there are solutions coming in the market now where this is automized, where you have also robots, uh, this is mainly still used today as a manual manual solution. And then we have. In the in the box here, uh, in this this that yeah, is this round round square, three three other solutions which we call the automatic uh, connection devices, so the ACDs, and these are uh, yeah connection charging interfaces that are automized, so there's no manual intervention at all. Uh, maybe to start in the middle here we call this the the roof mounted uh, ACD or roof mounted pantograph. It's fairly uh, similar like uh, you maybe know from a tramway uh, where the device is mounted on the roof and it is charged, uh, it's going up to a uh, piece of infrastructure. On the left side, it's a, it's a variant, uh, it's called the infrastructure mounted pantograph. 
And uh, on the right side, we have a solution which is coming from underneath, from under, from in the ground, and it is connecting to the to the underside of the, of the bus. So these three are um, yeah, automatic connection devices. And I should say, uh, maybe interesting for the specialists and the audience that the roof mounted pantograph on in the middle here and uh, the very left, so the, the, the plug, uh, the manual plug, it's absolutely the same uh, technology in terms of, uh, well, you mentioned the four separated uh, pins. Uh, so it's, it's the same uh, standard and it's the same interface. It's only, as I presented uh, differently. A um, few examples uh, from those automated connection devices. So type, the type A you see here, it is the uh, infrastructure mounted uh, solution, also called the inverted pantograph in this, uh, contrast with, uh, with the, the roof mounted pantograph. And you will see here a very nice example of uh, the EBSF2 project, so European Bus System of the Future project, so a project that UITP coordinated, finished some years ago. And where you see a very nice application of, uh, of an electric bus uh, entering in the built environment, and where uh, where, where the pantograph uh, is let's say mounted on the on the infrastructure side, uh, so it's very uh, aesthetic uh, solution. Of course, you need uh, you don't need a pantograph on the bus, so it's an advantage. It's a little bit lighter, but you do need uh, yeah reliable charging poles uh, across uh, the city along the bus lines to, uh, to be able to, uh, to recharge the batteries. So type A, uh, and then if we go through this schema of uh, automatic connection devices, we go to the type B, which is the roof uh, mounted pantograph. So here you see in a, yeah, a picture from uh, uh, one of the partners in this short project, so UITP member uh, TMB in, uh, in, in Spain, where you see very nice uh, detail here of the this, this, this triangle, which is the hood uh, where uh, the, um, uh, the pantograph is uh, connected to. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, all the buses uh, of the line uh, need to be equipped, obviously, with, uh, with this pantograph. And um, yeah, we also have here a nice example maybe for uh, getting back on the, on the on these charging technologies and the charging strategies, as I mentioned uh, at the opening. Uh, it is not uh, so that it is absolutely necessary to, to go for either one or the other technology. Right? We have uh, examples uh, enough here. This is an example from the Netherlands, uh, from, from the place where my predecessor was uh, speaking from. Uh, actually in Eindhoven in, uh, in the southern part where the operator has chosen for a combination of uh, technologies, namely type B, so you see, you see the, the roof mounted pantograph and also uh, yeah, a traditional uh, plug inlet and combo, combo uh, charging in, on the bus. So two technologies, but also a mixed uh, charging strategy, and uh, it is also very nice to, let's say, to to see here on the scheme. So there is possibility on the left to, to charge the bus on the route uh, with an uh, with a pantograph. You see, and this can be done um, uh, with a fast charging technology. Uh, and if you go into the to the right of that uh, scheme, so where you have the two the two bubbles, uh, it is a strategy still of charging on the on the network. But where the actually the vehicles are uh, swapped, meaning the, the, the empty vehicle uh, with empty batteries is going out of service to be recharged uh, at a certain speed, and a new vehicle is being injected uh, on the on the line to replace that vehicle. So it's the vehicle swapping uh, strategy that is also applied uh, in conjunction with uh, with the others. And then on the in, on the right side of this scheme, you see. Uh, also a, a depot uh, in the bubble and the, the buses, uh, some of the buses are recharged quickly uh, on, the, yeah, on the premises of the depot to go back in service afterwards. And then during the night, uh, when the buses are out of service, they are plugged uh, like uh, with the manual plug on the, on the network and they are 
charged uh, at a slow uh, speed. So a combination of technologies and strategies in one single operation. And last but not least, to complete this picture of um, automatic connection devices, there's the third type C, uh, which is underneath. Uh, so it is quite innovative uh, technology still emerging. Uh, I must say this, this is only a picture from a pilot project in uh, Malaga, Spain, uh, from, a, from a bus manufacturer, I think from Finland and, and uh, uh, charging technology from Alstom. Uh, it is for a moment stopped, so the test is over. And uh, yeah, we read in the press last week that uh, in, uh, in Paris, uh, Ile de France Mobilité is, uh, has decided to equip uh, two of their future BRT bus lines with this uh, type C charging technology. So we are very eager also at UITP to follow the developments of uh, the experiences with uh, this technology. Um, yeah, um, back to the charging uh, strategies uh, after uh, sort of a quick uh, quick scan of the uh, of the automatic connection devices. So I put them here again on the uh, on the on the sheet. But maybe not necessary to elaborate too much on that. We have been discussing it uh, in previous sessions as well. Overnight charging, opportunity charging. Uh, I added here the flash charging, which is uh, let's say uh, yeah, quite separate technology with very high power uh, charging and very short uh, uh, charging times for the buses, uh, which we have seen in operation in, in, in a city like Geneva or Nantes in France. And then also a specific, I would say, charging strategy linked to the technology of trolley buses. And so we have still uh, 300 uh, trolleybus cities uh, in operations uh, across the world uh, and this technology is also innovating with, uh, yeah, with possibilities to add a battery pack in a trolleybus which is charged during uh, operations uh, on the tro trolley line and which can run uh, I would say, yeah, offline uh, of charging wires for, uh, for several kilometers so it's a kind of different technology but also part of the uh, overview of strategies. Um, yeah, maybe uh, interesting also a window here from uh, maybe more from a manufacturing perspective. It's Heliox, uh, one of the charging infrastructure uh, builders. Uh, so here another approach. You could say, okay, if you would uh, simply focus on the place of operations, either in the depot or on, on, the, on the line, you could say, okay, from, from the depot charging, there's also a whole range of technologies available and you can uh, charge in the depot with, with the plug. Uh, if, if you have the charging infrastructure, you can charge in the depot with the automatic connection devices, either with the pantograph on the roof or with the pantograph down. Uh, it doesn't matter really, because this technology uh, is compatible with, uh, with the place where, where you charge here at the depot. Of course, for the opportunity charging on route, uh, this manufacturing is proposing let's say, the technology with the pantograph up or down uh, can be chosen. And then uh, on the right side, I already gave the example of the Netherlands. Uh, this technology uh, can be uh, combined in a network in, in a city where you have both the depot charging, opportunity charging mixed uh, according to the best, uh, I would say, operational needs of, uh, of the network and, and the city. Um, in a nutshell, uh, try to summarize here uh, yeah, some key characterizations of, uh, of each of the uh, uh, charging uh, strategies. Uh, overnight charging, so at, uh, at night, slow charging. Uh, what you see here is the key key characterization is that you need uh, yeah, lots of batteries uh, on board of the bus. Uh, um, we, we know, or maybe you, you do know, that the average uh, mileage uh, of, a, of a bus uh, during a, an operational day can be around 200, 250, sometimes more kilometers. And of course, this uh, need to be carried on board of, uh, of the bus, so high uh, battery capacity and also linked to the charging 
uh, technology, uh, yeah, you need to have the right adopted uh, chemistry of, uh, of the batteries. So this is another, say, another module of uh, the training, I suppose, but there's lots of development and uh, uh, innovation also going on in the chemistry uh, development of, uh, of the battery types. So batteries are charged from the grids only while buses are stationary at the depot. And uh, yeah, for every feasibility study for electrification, it's important to, to make this uh, trade-off and between the, the passenger capacity, the transport capacity of the bus and uh, yeah, the battery size that you want to uh, embark on, uh, on the buses. And uh, yeah, as a typical energy consumption, uh, we observe, uh, I would say, across, uh, across the UITP membership from the operators, around 1 to 1 1.2 uh, kilowatt hours uh, per kilometer for a standard bus without, and it's important to mention, uh, counting the, let's say, the thermal comfort, uh, so the heating or cooling during uh, winter or uh, summer days. Um, similarly, uh, for, let's say, the, uh, the depot charging, there's an illustration here from, uh, from the Scandinavian country, I think it's from Sweden, so depot charging, it's with a plug, well, actually here you see uh, two plugs, where uh, the bus is simply uh, yeah, charged uh, during non-service hour at the bus, uh, sorry, at the, at the bus carriage, yeah. Uh, a plug, manual plug, but it can also uh, be done with a similar uh, with functionality, but without, uh, without manual plug, and then the buses are here charged with this automatic connection device. So the second strategy is opportunity charging. Uh, main uh, uh, characteristic here is then immediately that there is the need for smaller uh, batteries. So this is very interesting for, for the operator. Uh, we are talking about battery capacity between 60 to 150 kilowatt hours. And again, also with adopted uh, battery chemistry that can support the, uh, the charging uh, speeds and the, the charging frequencies. Of course, those buses have shorter uh, autonomy, so they need to be organized in a, and they need to be planned in a way that they can be recharged during uh, bus operations. And also here, the batteries are charged from the grid only while the buses are static, uh, so stopped at the, at the terminals. And of course, when buses are stopped, this has also an impact on the, yeah, on the economics of operations. As, the driver, of course, who is waiting, will still have to be uh, paid as a, as a staff resource. Uh, for the flash charging, uh, so highly uh, high power technology and kind of yeah, special, uh, special solution, uh, 600 kilowatt uh, for charging power and very short uh, charging time. So it can be done really at the bus stop. Uh, and recently the BRT system in Nantes in France uh, had equipped their uh, line, a very high capacity line with double articulated buses with this technology uh, that is uh, proposed by ABB and Hess from Switzerland. Uh, and last but not least, uh, emotion charging for trolley buses. So it is uh, an existing uh, electric bus technology, I would say for uh, about a century, uh, where uh, yeah, this specific innovation uh, is going on on what we call the in-motion charging, IMC. So where the buses can, uh, can run uh, offline off, the, off uh, the charging wires with, uh, with a battery, battery pack. And we see quite a lot of uh, cities actually that have trolley bus systems in operations, be it in uh, Shanghai or Beijing, but also recently we had a presentation in the trolley bus committee from Mexico City, where they uh, reinvest uh, in the fleet renewal of trolley buses and where they adopt this IMC technology. So all in all, there's lots of uh, yeah, technology available on the market. Um, the project focused a lot on the interoperability of those uh, yeah, charging uh, solutions uh, for, for, let's say, a specific bus operator, bus fleets, because uh, yeah, you should know that uh, bus fleets are often very large. Uh, we, we talk about 9,000 buses in London or 4,000 buses in Paris. 
uh, and the, the fleets they are renewed, I would say with a natural pace. So every every year a certain batch of buses are uh, renewed, and of course over time you you want to have also stability that, uh, that the future buses uh, are still compatible with uh, the charging infrastructure. So what we call they need to be able to be uh, mixed and they need to match uh, between uh, between the different brands. And we, uh, yeah, as a sort of deliverable, we produced uh, a video, which is a two minutes, two minutes video, uh, how to, let's say, show the exactly the, the highlights of the benefits of this interoperability uh, yeah, requirement and how to assure this in, um, in the procurement and the operations of uh, electric buses. And if, uh, if, if, uh, time, if left, time left, uh, share two, uh, I would like to ask you to, to play the, the clip. It's, uh, yes. it's a two minutes yeah, clip that we just released yesterday. Thank you so much, Arno. The, the video is ready. Like, yeah. Thank you and interoperability of electric vehicles and chargers are key for the large-scale deployment of electric fleets in cities. When interoperability is guaranteed, operators can mix and match different brands of vehicles and chargers. This makes their integration into transport networks easier and less costly. However, the standardization of e-bus charging has not yet been fully achieved and official standards are still not released. To support the work of standardization bodies worldwide, the EU-funded project Assured has defined a set of standards and protocols which now make it possible to test interoperability, guaranteeing flexible and cost-effective e-bus operations. Let us show you how. Assured brings together stakeholders from the entire transport and energy supply sectors across the European Union. By considering their different needs and interests, Assured creates innovative, fast charging solutions for a more diverse and flexible electric vehicle market. During the project, electric buses, trucks and vans test different types of charging solutions. Here, the effects of mass deployment on the grid are also considered. Let's have a look at what solutions are tested in Assured. Next to the already standardized plug manual charging solution, in Assured, three types of so-called automated connection devices for ultra-fast charging have been further developed and standardized. This means that buses and chargers using the same technology can work together independent of the brand. This solution consists of a pantograph installed within the charging station. The setup requires wireless communication and the charging starts when the pantograph has made contact to the vehicle top rails. This solution simplifies the vehicle structure. The downside is that a single pantograph failure can affect multiple vehicles. This solution places the pantograph on top of the bus, so it reduces the cost of the charging infrastructure, both along the route and at the depot. The roof-mounted pantograph is currently the most common charging solution in Europe. However, the pantograph might add some weight, height and cost to the vehicle. Here, a current collector fitted underneath the vehicle lowers automatically and contacts the pads embedded in the ground at the bus stop to start the charging. The setup is using wireless communication and three contact pads. This innovative solution is further developed within Assured and has seen a successful pilot in another project. Assured is also testing wireless fast charging for vans. This technology can be useful for freight operators as the charging can happen automatically while parking or during pickup and delivery service. By creating widely applicable and flexible charging solutions, Assured unites the interests of many different players and adapts to the diverse needs of operators and existing infrastructures of European cities. This way, Assured takes standardization to the next level making one great leap forward towards sustainable urban mobility.
thank you very much, Ardo, for explaining several options of e-bus charging. Do you have an advice for those cities with limited resources but are interested in testing different charging configurations and technologies, say like uh, opportunity charging? Um, are there, for example, mechanism being provided by technology providers uh, that you know of that allows potential clients to test the technologies uh, without committing the full upfront equipment uh, investments? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I would, Sorry, I would definitely, I would definitely recommend for uh, for cities, you know, where where there are plans to electrify to uh, uh, to to start with the uh, uh, with really making an uh, an, an assessment uh, of uh, of the needs of uh, the, the existing bus system of the existing bus lines to make to start really by the needs and to uh, yeah to make really a feasibility study. First, what is uh, uh, yeah, what's, what is available? I would say in terms of technologies to to fit to those needs, and to uh, also include in this feasibility study uh, what is the local market, uh, let's say, available for for that city. Because uh, I mean, it is not obvious that all technologies available across the globe can be can be exported and uh, mounted uh, on the spot. Uh, so we always say, and we also do these exercises in the trainings. Uh, to, to uh, forget in the first step about the existing technologies and to really look at the needs and only then um, yeah, try to start uh, making this, this feasibility study for, for the local configuration. I would say that uh, the, the cost component, of course, is, is an important one and uh, linked to the, to the resources available in the city and uh, also the funding possibilities. So we see that in, I would say, in low, uh, low labor cost markets uh, compared to uh, for Europe, for instance, or, or America, uh, that, that more often the slow charging technology uh, is, uh, is opted. Uh, but it is also uh, often justified, I would say, in the in the local economical context, right? Because the 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 the, the salary of the of the wages of the drivers, uh, for an example, is absolutely not the same level uh, as as in Europe or in other places. So these are all important parameters to uh, to consider inside a feasibility study. So, what are the prerequisites for developing the model that you have shown? Uh, to other cities, so can we also do some forecasting? It depends a bit on which models you want to run. So, because there's a, there's a great variety in models. So, for example, if you want to start running the EV, EV uh, electrical bus models, then the prerequisites are quite low. Actually, what you need is um, you need some you need a bus schedule basically, uh, and we need um, some basic, uh, well, we've got a, quite a lot of buses and, and charging infrastructure in there that we can place on the map ourselves. So uh, the things we need are the, the schedule and the location of possible, uh, for the visualization, that is the location of the possible charging stations. So depots, for example, or bus stops. Then you can already start running um, the whole EV, tooling tool set you can you can actually start doing simulations with that if you want to combine that with more advanced things like environment and traffic then the data requirements get more steep because then you start needing traffic models you start needing the actual physical road infrastructure um, and things like that so and if you want to go for it for the whole um, uh, air uh, emission things like that, then you also need the the buildings of the of the area, for example. Um, so depending on the on the models, um, you need more or less data. So the, the EV model is actually quite easy to implement in a, in a test run, and then you there are actually a lot of information you already can get out of it. For example. Uh, uh, what is my uh, uh, what are my grid requirements based on uh, on the bus schedules on the on the charging schedules? You can also play with different charging um, strategies, opportunity charging, depot charging, things like that. You don't need a lot of data for that, but for combining different domains, then it, the data requirements become more steep. Thank you so much presentation by Vittorio Ravello. He's a global innovation electri uh, 
uh, Electric uh, Program Manager at Fiat Source, uh, Resource Center or CREF. Uh, he has a 29 years of experience and is an expert in the area of EVs, uh, EV standardization and related e-power systems. So uh, yeah, Victoria, floor is yours. Good morning to everybody. Uh, scope of my speech will be to focus on some side, but I feel a relevant element about the charging itself, independently the way you do, let me say, and give you some hint on the trends. I work in the research domain, so I have some view of which can be the future. And for who has to make investment, uh, clearly that's an important element to be kept into account because investment on infrastructure are huge and in general uh, become effective if can be applied for a certain time. If they are to be refurbished in two or three years, it become a nightmare. In this slide, I put you two picture. On the left, you see a classical refueling station and on the right, uh, a typical DC fast charging station, at least for conventional cars. And as you can see from the picture, they seem very similar. So the message for the customer is don't worry, at the end, you leave a word and you come in another word that is very close to the one you leave. That's for some extent true. The big effort we are doing also with standard and so on is try to make it as much as possible true, but there are some differences. And these differences has to be taken deeply into account in my mind. Uh, for instance, when I do refueling, I am transferring a fuel. So refuel means take a fuel from a place and put a fuel in another, like to put water, from a bottle in a glass. When I do battery charge, I am not transferring electrons in the vehicle. That's a, a wrong picture of the story in the sense that electric circuit is closed, what comes in comes out. All the electrons coming in the vehicle from the plus comes out from the minus. Uh, at the same time, this passage of electrons enable another thing that is the one making the charge, that is enable chemical reaction, in particular, a reduction oxidation reaction. So it's a complete different mechanism. Again, back to the standard world in which we are today, uh, maybe we are not aware of, but when you may click on the pistol of our system making the charging, we are making pass in our hands uh, a large number of uh, kilowatt. In particular, we can run between low to 100 of kilowatt hour up to uh, megawatt. So the power level we are transferring is really impressive. A clearly managed man megawatt in the electric domain is not so simple. And in general, uh, the story is not so easy because if I want to make a real complete charge of the vehicle, I need longer time. All the DC fast charging solution are partial charge, maybe convenient, maybe effective, but not full. And higher is the so-called C rate. So some way the ratio between the power of I put in the battery and the energy of the battery, more uh, critical can become the behavior for the battery side. Uh, the last presentation by Aaron has been very, very useful in this direction. If you have seen uh, the faster is the bus charging I want uh, going to the flash charging, meaning I put in a short term, a lot of power on the vehicle lower is the energy I can imagine to have in the bus, because imagine to have this at each bus stop. In principle, I can imagine to have on board a very small battery. That's perfect, but from the battery side, created the highest challenge, because you have the highest power with the lowest energy of the battery. Why is important charging? Because the time and efficiency of this process are largely impacting the perception. Uh, obviously, except speaking about charging motion, it is also an option, the train, tramway, and also the one presented in the last presentation. Uh, charging with vehicle not in motion means that when I'm charging the vehicle, I cannot use the vehicle for motion. And that means uh, if the time of charging is not so short, uh, a certain unavailability of the vehicle for the charging time duration. Very relevant is also the efficiency. Why is so relevant the efficiency? Because uh, efficiency impacts on what I pay. When I transfer fuel from the station to the tank of the car, I am paying the fuel I am transferring. When I pay the charging process, I pay the energy that becomes available plus the efficiency of the charger, so the losses in particular, 
plus the losses of the battery chemical process. And these two numbers are not 100%. And so how lowest they are, how higher is the payment that the customer has to face in respect to what he is at the end taking. It's like in a comparison to have a fuel station which there is a hole in your pipe and you pay more fuel than the one that comes in your tank. At the same time, the way in which I connect the battery to the charging, in the previous presentation, you see a very comprehensive and wide way in which we are imagining or doing this, has multiple effects. The first is the user experience, totally different and automatic system by a manual. The level of involvement is totally different, clearly. The electrical safety, in some cases, this automatic solution, for instance, make more sure the solution, in other maybe less because I need to put my hands on my voltage system, and also the level of complexity, cost, and uh, uh, volume dimension of the infrastructure to make it possible. Uh, what about the trends? Uh, I use this slide because I find this very useful. As you can see by the footnote, is a 216 slide coming from Porsche. So maybe some, for a research guy a lot of years ago, maybe for who looks at the infrastructure not so far time ago, five years. Five years ago, this was the picture. We were used to speak about, at least for cars, five, 50 kilowatt fast charging. Someone was starting to speak about 100, 140, 150. And someone was starting to open the door to higher voltage of the battery, going to voltage batteries more close to the bus one, 800. And at this point with the same current roughly reaching double digit of the figure seen before. Uh, so you see 50 to 220, four times bigger. Today, on the other end, after five years, we commonly speak about 350 kilowatt at 800 volt, so a further step in the hands. A new study, new research speaks about also for the car area, number going closer and closer to one megawatt for the reason I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, for who looks the picture in terms of perspective, wonderful, great. For who is to pay to make the infrastructure can be a killing factor. If you decide and you put in place a 50 kilowatt infrastructure, that what the advice five years ago, now we realize that there's an infrastructure totally not fitting the goal. And so that's very important. This big push of technology can be very useful, very nice, very promising, but also open the door to an higher complexity in selecting the right solution with 10, 15, 20 years landscape in front. At the end of the story, why the power is so much pushed up? Because at the end, energy is the product of power by time. This is physics. And at this point, as said before, higher is the energy you want to put in the vehicle. For instance, that's what is happening in the cars. Higher will become the power to have the same time of charge. And anyway, further higher power if I want also in parallel to reduce the time to the few minutes uh, today uh, possible with a standard car. At this point, uh, this means charging power higher and higher. Just to give you a simple example, imagine this is for cars. Uh, 60, 100 kilowatt hour typical energy on board for mid-size, big-size cars. And this is typical uh, partial 80% charging time today and what I want in the future. It means moving, putting together the lowest energy and the low and the highest time, this power level. But if I want to reach read in future, the 100 kilowatt hour in five minutes means that. So this is one charging volt can move from a factor five. And that's uh, assuming, and this is a calculation simplified and negligent the efficiency mentioned before, assuming the battery and the technology follow you because technology means uh, cables, today water cool, oil cooled to make it possible, connectors, batteries, and so on. Is uh, all the system has to support this step in advance. Good point already mentioned at the beginning by ARM is that a good, very important point of electrical domain is that I can change a paradigm. Instead to charge only at the charging station, like I do today with fuel, I can imagine multiple charging places. And at least for vehicles, maybe not the buses, but for the more private that are a lot of the time parked, open the door to large time to make charging also at a lower power, longer time with a higher efficiency and a lower environmental 
because efficiency means at the end also CO2 emission and, and by any, in general efficiency and cost, but also in terms of a, a life of the battery and impact on that. Um, complementing this different option becomes useful. In the case of not public transportation, but private transportation, for instance, the C fast charging perfect for highway may be not so useful in town. I can realize that for my general usage, I really do not use it. If I have a comprehensive ecosystem designed to support me, clearly if I do the dream land and the dream place with all the charges spot that I like interoperable and so on, it works. If I am a scenario without a garage, without a charging place at the work, at the, at the work uh, office, uh, the story can become totally different. So one story is what is today, one other is which is the final scenario and how can I move it realistically with the timing, the cost and the investment and so on. In this scenario, an interesting element already mentioned in the previous presentation is the vehicle to grid. What means I can really imagine my car as an active element of the grid. Why? Because this link to charge the vehicle can, I don't want to say easily, but technically possibly with technology that are not rocket science, become bidirectional and pretty, pretty first car going on the market with this capability are coming. I feel with the publication of the famous standard ISO 15, 11, 8 slash 20, it will become a real also in a few months uh, for a lot of car makers, for instance, in Europe. Having this capability open the door for cars in particular that are long term, for long time parked, the door to use when convenient, the energy or the power of the battery also to support the grid locally, it is called vehicle to home, for instance, to interact with the solar roof, but also globally behind the meter, beside, uh, meaning on the grid. Imagining obviously the complexity shown by ARM of the, uh, let me say, complementing action of the player behind the plug, the, plug, the so called charging point operator, e mobility service provider, e roaming platform company manager, because there's a ecosystem of complex ecosystem of companies behind that. And this, as I said, open the door to help with the vehicle in a combined way to support the peak of the grid. To imagine this uh, dreamland, we need to be efficient and battery also the one on car can help it like it is, but it is another chapter not for today, the option to use the so-called exhausted car batteries, that means having lost typically 20% of the initial capacity for second life application of a vehicle. Few slides to the end, someone already mentioned the, the charging motion for big vehicles, a typical option is at the end to take experience by train, tramway, trolleybus and so on. Here you see the experience with the pantograph on the vehicle side, as you have seen, you can also have the opposite. This is continuous, you have seen at the end, uh, in the short term at least, uh, it's more convenient to go to, uh, for when possible, for buses, for instance, to have the uh, high voltage connection only at the stop. But there is also, already mentioned also in the last presentation by Arno, the idea to go towards wireless. Wireless can be another option. Here you see wireless uh, in the uh, dynamic way, so in motion. Here you see some example of a real project in which the technical feasibility has been already, already reached. Uh, for instance, you can imagine to have an highway with uh, uh, a line devoted for that in which the vehicle, for instance, with future uh, side level of automated driving can run at constant speed of, for instance, 60 km per hour, recharge the battery and then go back in the main route and run for another part and then go back again. Clearly, uh, is something to be uh, developed. For instance, there will be is in progress the, the activity in Italy, a project on the so-called Brebemi Highway that is close to Milan to test uh, in more than one kilometer real scenario this uh, technology involving an Israeli company called Electra. Uh, another option is the swap. The swapping, I feel, is a winning solution for a very small vehicle, as already mentioned by other presenters. Uh, for instance, in India, for small vehicle is already in really place. I know that uh, motorbike, e-motorbike maker, Japanese, European, are working together to standardize that. 
Four cars has been a dream in the past already experience uh, and with no success. Uh, the better place experience is an example. Now again, there are new companies like Ample that are pushing the technology clearly. It works well in a very directive uh, environment like it is China. In China, there is a company called NIO that is doing with the government support everything, batteries, cars, swapping station, and so on. And so in this case, they standardize their solution by themselves. Last but not least, uh, it's not a matter of this presentation, but to keep open your, your eyes and mind, uh, another technology on the edge is hydrogen. I don't see hydrogen like a, let me say, competitor of electricity. A hydrogen vehicle like this one is also a buffer a unit of battery on board, for instance. So they are complementary, not one against the other. In this case, you move the story to the charging time of a liquid or a gaseous fuel, depending on the temperature and pressure. And it is more close to the technology we are living, but with the same environmental effect. Probably in this, let me say, environment, picture, scenario, ecosystem, take care where useful and convenient. Also, this option can be a complementary good solution, depending on the case, to reach the goal of a sustainable, at all the level, uh, environment cost uh, and usage of this green technology that at the end everybody was need. Said this, I thank you for the attention. Um, so when when should cities install fast charging and when will so when 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 the slow charging suffice? So is there a thumb rule for decision makers? Let me say uh, in general, in my opinion, DC fast charging is a very effective technology for long, uh, let me say, usage. Back to the slide of the different scenario, highway. The idea to have in the today refueling station on the highway, the DC charging station, at least for cars, sounds very logical. In town, frankly speaking, I don't see it so much relevant. I've seen a very interesting activity done by Volkswagen that has built up a component company building DC fast charger. Uh, they imagine to create a ring of DC fast charger on the periphery, on the suburbs of the big cities, in order to have a limp home mode for users that has to go back home and has an unplanned further trip to do. So let me say uh, enabling charging in case they need assuming that for the main part of the day for who use it, most, more vehicles in the town not needed. In this case, the idea is not to make the full partial, partial fast charge there, but just a few minutes to go back home. And to make lower the impact on the city grid, they are already presenting solution in which the average power is coming from the grid, but the peak is managed using second life battery that are integrated in the station. So in this way, they create another, let me say, wise ecosystem in the charging station, not impacting so much to the grid, so to the peaks, because imagine to make this fast charge or millions of cars together would be a nightmare, clearly, and taking advantage of battery coming from the vehicle, so creating this uh, uh, effective uh, ecosystem. Uh, on the other hand, I feel that in town, it's important, uh, and here the answer largely depends on how many garages there are at the end. If people as an average, uh, like in some uh, North Europe, uh, the Central Europe area, uh, the home garage, no problem. They can do the main part of the charge in the night at home. And they surely have a wonderful office with a parking slot with a charging in front. If you go in the south part of Europe without going in uh, other country, in other uh, continents, you immediately realize that it's not so common to have garage. It's not so common to have in office a wise uh, company giving you these facilities. And so they are probably the public uh, uh, body, the public uh, company managing the, the local mobility in the, low, in the city, in the town, has to complement more widely this uh, with uh, charging slot, public charging slot on the road, AC in this case, maybe 11 kilo or something like that, in order to uh, make also possible to imagine that a vehicle for who has not the chance to charge at home and in office. That today is the real barrier, leaving out the cost. If you have not the way to charge at home or charge at the working place for a private today, the first question, how can I manage? Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Jose Buenbien. Bien 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 B
uh, from De La Salle University in the Philippines. Uh, he's an expert in an area of sustainable mobility, environmental modeling, energy modeling, uh, EVs, and smart mobility. Uh, he's also an executive director of EVAP, uh, Florisier's uh, Doc Manny. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. I don't know where you, where, where are you from, but it should cover everyone. Yeah. So uh, I was also listening to the previous talk and part of the previous presentations. And uh, um, I'm sure after hearing all those advanced uh, technologies, advanced processes, you'll be very disappointed with what I'm gonna present. I'm gonna present something Okay, really low tech. I'm gonna present something. What is what I'm gonna present? What are the realities on, on the ground in a developing country? The uh, technical capacities, the financial cap capabilities in developing countries are very much different from 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 developed countries. So uh, that also somehow dictates the technologies that are being adopted in in these countries. Or specifically, I'll be talking about the case of the, of the Philippines. So I'll be starting by uh, giving an overview of EVs in the Philippines. And uh, I'll be focusing my talk on the charging uh, challenges of EGPs and e trikes I'm sure uh, for you, for, for all of you here, also from developing countries, you might have something equivalent in, in, in your areas. Uh, I'll be talk, touching a little bit about charging economics, who charge in what way. As indicated, the program, I'm supposed to compare vehicle charging, onboard charging versus, uh, versus uh, battery swapping. And then I'm going to be talking more about the charging mode trajectory. Okay, will battery swapping, for example, stay or Eventually, the industry expected to shift towards more fast charging, and then some key points. Yeah, uh, so in this slide shows the uh, the vehicle mix, electric vehicle mix in the different Southeast Asian countries. And uh, unlike Thailand, for example, which has now have a, now which now has a big uh, um, electric car population, Philippines is still mostly. The, the electric vehicle mix in the Philippines is mostly consist of uh, consist of electric tricycles, electric two wheelers, and also uh, uh, some utility vehicles, and those are mostly the electric jeepneys. And Singapore, of course, okay, if uh, Tesla Tesla is thinking of putting up a service center in Singapore, this only means that uh, Singapore is focusing more on high end high-end vehicles, and that dictates also what charging network do they have. So by looking at the vehicle mix, the type of electric vehicles, that tells you also what charging network would the different countries would be needed. Yeah, uh, some more about the electric GPs in the Philippines. So I have been here a, a, a six, a seven, seven electric chimney models. It, it provides you the passenger capacities, the battery types, so all of them use uh, lithium phosphate batteries, the nominal voltages, the battery capacities, charging types, and the energy top up mode. As you will see there, okay, down, down below you have two models that utilizes battery swapping. And if you're going to look at the battery capacities, they're not really that big compared to the normal electric cars. So the range of these vehicles normally is only limited to 30 to 60 kilometers. Okay, the biggest would be the one of Gets, okay, which uh, goes up to about 100 uh, kilometers. So it's not that long, really. So that's why the charging component really plays a very big role. In, in the use of in the use of this uh, of these vehicles. So um, these are mostly limited range as mentioned. Um, these are captured they, they these are captured charging at the depot during off peak hours if they do uh, vehicle charging. 
So there's there are no public charging points. So they okay, each of these uh, operators would have their own uh, charging system in the depot and then they charge their load during off peak hours. And for the battery swapping uh, units, swappings are done at the battery station operated by the transport cooperative and or the vehicle supplier themselves. And um, normally these batteries have a 0.5C ratings with one zip pick, but no cooling system. So that's why uh, this, the, the operators are very afraid of uh, charging them at their picks. So normally they would charge them at 0.5C. In fact, that's already quite high. Normally they would charge it around 0.33, 0.25C. Because in, in previous, uh, previous experiences indicated that uh, uh, charging them at higher rates hits up the battery because as I've said, there are no cooling systems and uh, it led to premature, uh, premature damages. I have now in here a listings of the different tricycles used in the Philippines. So these are the three meters. These are the equivalents of tuk-tuks or in, 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 in Thailand. And these are the equivalents of the auto rickshaws in, uh, in, in India. So the most of these vehicles are charged via battery swapping, except for a couple of the couple of the units. Similarly, also, if you would see the battery capacities, they are quite small. Okay, normally, the range are limited to 30 to 50 kilometers. So similarly, also the same as with, uh, as with chimneys, the charging system plays a very important role in their operation. In the profile, actually, it's very similar to that of chimneys. Very limited range. Yeah, but this time, uh, these this units are charged at home during off-peak hours. So the driver goes home, then the battery goes down, charge it there, and then goes back again to the terminal and pick passengers. So these vehicles are normally operated informally. There are no reset schedules. So the vehicles get operated whenever the operator feels like driving them around. So yeah, so they go home, charge at home, and then go back go back to the, to the terminal. If for the sw swapping uh, battery uh, vehicles, similarly also swapping are done at the battery station operated with transport cooperative and or the vehicle supplier. And this vehicle normally use similar battery system as battery cells as with those of, uh, as with those of electric chips because normally uh, these are produced also by the same, by the same manufacturers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just some view on uh, what are what the numbers looks like. Okay, in in, in in the Philippines, I got this from our current um, key design work. So we're looking at okay, are we going for lithium phosphate batteries, which are slow charging, or we go for lithium polymer titanium oxide. Okay. A bit of fast charging, and then we go to the ultra fast charging of you know, like the LTO batteries. So you would see there the standard charge rates 0.33C, 1C, 2C, maximum charge rates. So for LTO, you can really charge them fast. They have also a significantly larger cycle life, at least on paper. Because um, so far, what we have really actually tested. Uh, long term are the LFPs. Uh, we're just looking at the possibility of going LPTO or or LTO. So these are the cell or pack capacities, okay, the cell pack cost. And um, okay, based on the indicated capacities there, um, okay, that, that leads us to the battery cost per kilowatt hour. So as you will see, the lithium phosphate battery still costs the least, 2.18 uh, pesos per kilowatt hour. For lithium polymer titrate oxide is 2.78, okay, and lithium titrate oxide is 2.74. Okay, that is in terms of the battery cost okay, per kilowatt hour. By the way, the assumption here is only half the, 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 the batteries would have half the life of 
of, of, of the specified cycle life. Um, okay, just to be more on the conservative side. <clears throat> okay, but if you look at the service cost, so that's the one, that's the graph that's on the lower left, you have the energy top up add on cost for EGPs that is per kilowatt R. Okay, those are pesos per kilowatt R. If you look at the swapping batteries, battery swapping versus fast charging, battery swapping uh, translates to a higher, to a higher servicing cost. Okay, why? Because you would need at least two persons to to load the to load the batteries, then bring them out, and then okay, operate the that operate the charging facility. While for fast chargers, okay, this could be self operated. So the service cost for swapping batteries is 13.36 pesos per kilowatt hour. In fact, it's even bigger than the cost of the electricity. Um, for the lithium, um, for, for, for the fast charging, it's only 4.13 pesos per kilowatt hour. So if you add on everything, the, the uh, battery swapping mode leads to higher, higher uh, cost, charging cost. Higher battery and battery and charging cost. So the question now is, uh, okay, why do still some of the vehicles use battery swapping? Okay, number one, higher cost of fast charging batteries. I, I think we can easily see there. Uh, and uh, okay, that is a very difficult problem to solve, especially if your vehicle suppliers have financial limitations. And especially so if you couple that with operators having very limited financial capacity as well. So the, the manufacturers of these vehicles, so these are locally made, are mostly small and medium scale industries. So if, okay, they were, if they're also going to do some part of the financing, I'm going to discuss more about that later on because your your market don't, don't, have, don't also have the financial capacities to invest on the vehicles directly uh, on, on their own. Okay, then okay, utilizing a very expensive okay, uh, uh, unit okay, would be would be a problem. So yeah, so why still use battery swapping? Higher cost of fast charging coupled with okay, vehicle supplier financial limitations a very limited operator financial capacity. And okay, some of the um, some of the um, vehicle manufacturers also thought, okay, why, why, why don't we put in their expensive batteries? We can look for some investors. And then okay, we'll just lease it out so that they don't have to cover the initial cost. Okay. But right now, there's a lack of battery monitoring and tracking system. Okay, although that, that is now being integrated in most of is in most of the of the vehicles okay, that are rolled out rolled out locally. There's also a lack of a fast charging network. One of the main disadvantages of doing battery swapping is uh, it limits the operation of vehicles in the vicinity of the battery swapping stations. So if you're talking uh, talking with operators, you would prefer the diesel run units because uh, they can use it somewhere else. Well, before the electric vehicles, they can just use it in the vicinity of the battery swapping stations. But if you've got fast charging network, okay, then that solves the problem. So I guess if the, if the uh, fast charging network is developed, okay, on their own, the operators will prefer would prefer fast charging batteries, even though they cost more. Okay, and we'll be adopting uh, fast charging instead of a uh, battery swapping. And we have also brought the problem of technology inertia. In the initial stages of electric vehicle adoption in the Philippines, the uh, transport industry had a lot of bad experiences. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they tried charging, because everything before was hit and miss. They charge charging the batteries using fast chargers, and then 
it, it, it prematurely uh, um, degraded the batteries. And uh, everyone thought now that, okay, even though you educate them, they will always say, okay, we, we don't want fast charging. We want slow charging. Slow charging is better. Yeah. Now, so can we that? Okay, then who swaps and who charges? Oh, it really depends on the business model. And um, okay, let us see. Okay, business form model number one. Normally, okay, this is used by fleet operators that have very limited financial capacity. So normally, these are the transport cooperatives. So okay, in this case, you have layer one, okay, providing the vehicles. And then you have battery leasing. Because normally it's battery swapping. So normally okay, the vehicles are sold with one battery set and then they list out the second battery. So the second battery is normally invested on by the manufacturer themselves. Okay, or in some cases, some operators would have the capacity also to buy a second, a second battery, a reserve, a, a spare battery that okay, they invest on that. Or in some cases, they, they do a joint venture. Then you have the vehicle financing and, and leasing. Vehicle financing and leasing normally is uh, supplied by the, a government bank. So in the Philippines, we have land bank and DBP right now. Philippines is doing, this is the process of modernizing its uh, public transport system. So, um, so P2 is the government bank. And however, okay, the government bank requires equity. Unfortunately, the fleet operators don't have enough financial capacity to build up the equity. So normally the manufacturing or the manufacturer, the suppliers of the vehicle also handles that equity, which is eventually also being paid back by the fleet operator. So the financing or the leasing uh, component, it's uh, being shared by a third party, normally a bank and the manufacturer. And then for the battery swapping or vehicle charging services, is either operated by the, by the manufacturer or the supplier of the vehicle or the operator themselves, or in most cases, they actually do a joint venture. Now let's go to the second business model. Okay, in the, business, in the second business model, okay, this also mostly involves cooperatives, but these are cooperatives that have more financial capacity than the first group. Okay, under this one, Normally, the manufacturing of the vehicles and the battery leasing, spare batteries, are invested on by the manufacturer of the vehicle. And then the manufacturer of the vehicle shares, okay, with, uh, sh shares the, uh, the task of providing the financing and leasing with a third party, normally the government bank. And it's the fleet operators that invest on the battery swapping and vehicle charging services. For business model number three, also, this focuses on cooperatives, okay, but this time, these are now cooperatives that are more cash than, the, than those adopting business model number two. So in this case, you have the manufacturers just focusing, the suppliers just focusing on producing and supplying the vehicles and party financing the adoption of the vehicles. It's the fleet operators that invest on the spare battery but the battery swapping and vehicle charging services and fleet operations. Now, there is also a fourth setup. Okay, in this case, okay, the battery manufacturer, the vehicle manufacturing, battery leasing, financing, and battery swapping are being handled by the vehicle supplier. So, okay, this applies to vehicle suppliers that have very good financial capability. So it's, he's able to cover everything. So what will the fleet operators do? They'll just have to list the vehicles and operate them and pay them a monthly fee. Or in some cases, they do avoid a joint venture. They do profit sharing. And normally, since these are supplied by suppliers or manufacturers that have good financial capacities, they, do, they, do, they adopt fast charging batteries and they're able to do fast charging. 
and they partner with um, local charging network providers. So it provides the needed market, assured market for the charging providers. So they invest in them and then okay, this operator, the, the, the charging, the, the manufacturer just focuses on providing the vehicles, okay, leasing the batteries, uh, financing, financing the whole system. And for business, business model number five, okay, normally this happens when the operator is a corporation. So they have the capacity to invest on, okay, on the vehicle. So you have a manufacturer that supplies the vehicle. Okay, the um, fleet operator invests on the, on the spare battery okay, or invests on a big battery that is capable of onboard charging. They do, they do their own financing. Uh, they do they operate and charge their own vehicle. They operate their own charging points. And then you, they do their own, they do the fleet operations, of course. And uh, okay, recently there's also a six business model here where everything is operated by one player from the supply of the vehicles, battery leasing, okay, so on and so forth. It's only being done by one player and uh, Normally, okay, this player adopts fast charging units. Now, why is battery swapping adopted? So as we have said before, cost is a problem. And if you're going to look at a comparison of electric chip fees and Euro 4 chip fees, okay, there's a very big difference between the cost of electric chip fees and Euro 4 chip fees. A may, a may not be as big as a difference in, uh, in other vehicle segments, but it's because okay, these vehicles are, are fitted with smaller batteries compared to say to, to the normal, normal electric uh, vehicles. But still, okay, that is a very big barrier for the adoption of these vehicles. And adding more onto that cost okay, would further discourage the market from adopting electric vehicles. So, what will most probably happen in the future? Okay, so we can now look at business model seven, number seven. You have the manufacturers just focusing on supplying the units. There will be a third party that will be invest that will be financing and leasing the units. So since the manufacturers will not be burdened anymore in in uh, co-investing on the financing, then you can focus on coming up with okay, better, better vehicles, longer range batteries. They can invest on, they can adopt uh, fast charging batteries. And you have also a third layer, investing, investing on battery leasing. And you have vehicle charging services either being operated by the battery leasing companies or third parties. And then you have fleet operators that will just be operating the, the units. Okay, the, the main difference as with okay, the previous one, as with this uh, business model number four, okay, is uh, business model number five and six. Okay, sorry about that. It's, these are four corporations. Okay, but with this model, the operator can focus on operating and yet they are cooperative because each of the components are handled by some by some by by by, by other by other parties. Okay, with that, okay, adopting fast charging batteries down and adopting fast charging okay, greatly brings down the energy cost. Okay, although of course it increases your, your battery leasing cost, okay, but the, the savings. You remember earlier that the service cost for battery swapping is a lot bigger than fast charging. So that's where actually the savings really comes from. So that drastically goes down and you end up with, the industry end up with, end up with more financial savings than what is currently happening. Okay. And okay, what will make this happen? So these are the failures. Number one, projected battery cost reductions. So projections indicated that batteries will be going down at least 60% by 2030. So we're hoping that if that trajectory is indeed, indeed is eventually followed, 
Okay, green routes. I think this is the biggest in ever. Okay, green routes is, is um, scheduled to be implemented in the Philippines. So green routes is our route specifically just for electric vehicles. So that creates now the demand. The main reason why no one is investing on battery leasing or rolling out third, where there are no third party key battery providers is uh, there's no mass demand. So you're, there's, there's no economy scale. So you end up with very expensive batteries. Uh, that's also the reason why there are no private uh, vehicle financing companies because okay, there's no demand, there's no sustained demand, and everyone is in a wait and see uh, uh, stage. So introducing green outs will create the demand. Okay, it will attract more manufacturers. It will create the economies of scale for the battery leasing, also for the manufacturers. That brings down the cost and partner with the projected cost reduction, battery cost reductions. So we're hopeful that Perpetu will have. He will have this uh, business model and the system. And of course, another enabler is to standardize the battery you or use or, or at least the charging standards for, for EGTs so that you'll have interchangeability. And of course, it follows with that also is to standardizing the batteries and uh, system voltages okay, in, 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 the, in the vehicle. So right now, if you review, if you look at the list that I provided earlier, the voltage, systems voltage of the different vehicles vary a lot. So that needs to be uh, standardized. So standardization needs to become needs to come in. Uh, but of course, still, okay, if you're looking at the fleet operations, fleet operators, you're looking at cooperatives, they lack the financial capacities. Another enabler here actually would be a guarantee fund, a government guarantee fund that would guarantee the loans of fleet operators. Introducing the green routes alone will not do the trick. In fact, it will be faced with the uh, resistance. So it's important that the government also comes in okay, to lessen the risk to, to, the, to the financing sector and um, okay, that should facilitate access to, to loans and adoption of this of these vehicles. Okay, and okay, removing the battery cost okay, from the vehicle, if you look at, for example, in the fast charging uh, uh, table, okay, that drastically bring, brings down the cost of the vehicle, in fact, even lower than the Euro 4 GT. So that is now without the vehicles. But of course, you increase the battery uh, leasing uh, cost. Okay, but that is further balanced by the especially rear by the savings on the on the up on the on the swapping services. Yeah. Sorry, Doc Mani, could you wrap up? Yeah. So to, to end my talk, um, just some key points. Fast charging is more economically preferred. Financial and technical capabilities of the vehicle supplier and operator dictates charging strategy in EGPs and bicycles. The right business model. Uh, could uh, sway top up to fast charging. And battery cost reduction, massive maturation, charging standards are the enablers. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Mani, for an overview um, of the charging opportunities for light electric vehicles and showing the system for uh, battery swapping and onboard uh, charging or fast charging. Uh, so battery swapping also create a scenario of uh, battery as a service and support minimizing the overall cost of vehicle uh, said like compared to fast charging. I have an immediate question here uh, from my colleague Alvin. So are there other equipment aside from the onboard vehicle charging or facility upgrades needed to enable fast charging? And other, other follow up is like a question. Um, in the case of Philippines, are there notable transmission or distribution network upgrade requirement to realize the fast charging? Yeah, uh, we did some modeling actually way back. So we, we, we came up with scenarios and we, we, we determined that uh, there won't be any uh, supply gaps. There won't be also, there won't also be any uh, um, transmission gaps. But of course, the distribution side it would be the case-to-case -case basis depending on the, on the city. 
So at least on the generation and the uh, generation and on the transmission side, there's no, okay, there's no problem. Why savings? Or ah, taxes okay. Is oh, negative? Okay, fuel in the Philippines is heavily taxed. So okay, shifting vehicles to electric vehicles, that means that is revenue lost to the government. So that's why it's negative. This presentation is um, by, by Dr. Uh, Sure Cheng. He's an assistant professor in transport studies at National Cheng Kung University. Good afternoon, everyone. My, my name is Sure Chen. I am an assistant professor in transport studies at National Chen Kung University in Taiwan. A uh, big thank you to Solutions Plus for inviting me over to share some stories about charging infrastructure deployment in Taiwan. And in the next 10, 15 minutes, I'll very briefly go through the status quo of Taiwan's transport sector and how it's been working on the e-mobility charging infrastructure at the national level and at the local level. And I'll be finishing by the lesson learned. And I think there would be opportunities we could talk in more details in the workshops or in trainings. So first of all, let's have a quick look into the status quo of Taiwan's transport sector. I think the best way to understand Taiwan's transport sector is to look at the model split. Through the national statistical analysis, it's very clear that private vehicles, including scooters, which is very common in this part of Asia or this part of the world, and private cars account for about 75% or even more of our everyday journeys. And whereas for public transport, cycling, walking, those active mobility, I think there is still room to grow. And I think on the left hand side, you can see the iconic scooter waterfall in Taipei, which you may come across um, the clips or pictures on social media and mainstream media. So it's fair to say that living in Taiwan, we heavily rely on private vehicles. And that also shows the importance of transitioning to electric vehicles, including e-scooters. And we have a look further sort of uh, investigation into the link between transport environment in Taiwan and um, you can tell just simply because the private vehicle takes the main stage um, of the uh, our everyday trips so it's inevitably private cars and scooters account for I would say again 60 to 70 percent of the transport emissions even though transport only accounts for 12 point uh, about 12.5% of the national total emissions and the fourth biggest emitters. However, road transport accounts for almost 100%, as Joe Drakingly, 95.57% of total transport emissions. And that again shows the importance of transitioning to e mobility in Taiwan, and uh, not just because it's the biggest polluter, but also because it's inevitably in the foreseeable future, people living in Taiwan will still heavily rely on private vehicles as their way uh, everyday living and main modes of transport. If I may share a little bit more information with you from the ownership of private vehicles, and it's even more evident that um, for every 100 population, there are 94.6 scooters. And for every 100 population, there are 34.8 cars in 2020. So you could say for every single Taiwanese, we actually own a scooter for ourselves, uh, which can be quite a um, issue. I think the government has been aware of the ever growing um, sort of the number of scooters and cars, and there are quite a few um, uh, uh, so policies and strategies that are in place or in the pipeline, which uh, we will talk about in the next few minutes. However, I think 
it's not a smooth sell for the electric mobility development in Taiwan. I think actually back in 2017, the national government actually has announced a few uh, important milestones, including the full electrification of government fleets and buses, and the full electrification of scooters, and the full electrification of cars. But unfortunately, even though those um, policies and strategies were announced in 2017, it's actually U10 in 2019 by the government itself is shooting itself in the foot by sort of reversing the policy. And back in 2020 and also this year 2021, the national government even announced the subsidy for gasoline powered scooters. And the subsidy is actually it's almost the same as that of the e-scooters and that was sending quite a sharp wave to the e-scooter industry because you could see in this um, data that even though in 2018 2019 there was this trajectory of the uptake of e-scooters in taiwan in 2020 you could see the setback in this e-scooter industry due to the introduction of the i would say the distorted subsidy for gasoline powered scooters I think lesson learned is that the government understand that um, from the U-turn, I would say, is that there was sort of a lack of stakeholder engagement actually to understand the industry and also to bring key stakeholders and key players together, including the manufacturers and e-charging service providers and users and so on and so forth. So. I think slowly on in the 2019 and 2020, the government started from the scratch again um, to pan out a more comprehensive regulation frameworks, um, including, uh, say, the, from the physical infrastructure for subsidy. I think those four uh, ministries are the, uh, the key ministries behind this program. And interestingly, in Taiwan, the Ministry of Economic Affairs um, usually provide that standardization, the uh, guidelines for installation and the maintenance quality, you could say the quality assurance. And um, because of um, the nature of the ministry, uh, it also can have has to come up with a subsidy program and also have to look into the outside of the spectrum, which is the consumer protection, the consumer's right, to make sure this particular e-charging industry is um, really in place is well designed and well panned out and of course when we talked about e-mobility inevitably we have to talk about environmental protection administration for all those e-scooter charging program the subsidy programs are actually derived from funding from the environmental protection administration and so you can see there's a, a clear division of responsibilities between government agencies, whereas Ministry of Economic Affairs is put in charge of electric cars and the Environmental Protection Administration is put in that place to take care of electric scooters. But after all, I think um, in terms of the infrastructure, it's the uh, responsibility of Ministry of Interior to announce the building requirement and the building regulation as well as fire safety regulation. And for the Ministry of Transportation, um, it has the responsibility to look into the space available, such as the parking lots and also the public facilities that has the potential to provide spaces for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. However, I think the national government Despite the fact, I think the national government has announced a few um, political and regulatory frameworks. It's all down to the local level that cities have to take actions to really deliver the e-charging infrastructure along with the, uh, the transition to e-mobility. So, whereas national governments are are, are in the right position to pan out the, the regulatory framework. Local governments are the ones who have to be creative, who have to come up with strategies and action plans. 
So here's an example from Taijun. The reason I, that I picked Taijun example is simply because uh, Taijun is now having a very good momentum uh, in that transition to e-mobility. Uh, it's the sort of the runner-up to, um, of course, to Taipei as to um, giving out subsidies or encourage the uptake of um, e-mobility. So there are a two-pronged um, approaches in place right now in Taichung. One is the public sector leads the way, private sector follows up for the private sector to, to set a rule book and to give the incentives. And I think on the other hand, uh, Taichung City also um, sort of encourages the public-private collaboration, which I will be uh, giving a bit more substance in the next few minutes. So. Interestingly, as opposed to if I may go back uh, to this slide again, that you can see very clearly at the national level, it's all about responsibilities. Which agency or which ministry has to take care of which, I would say, regulations or framework and subsidy program. Whereas, interestingly, at the local level, it's all about the actions and the problems, so the way they categorize the issues is by categorizing tasks, action plans, be it regulations, be it space, and be it incentives. So for regulation-wise, it's very clear that it comes from uh, the existing national regulations. However, local governments have the ordinance, have the autonomy, the freedom to make their own ordinance under the existing framework. And the low carbon city ordinance is a very popular one in Taiwan so that the governments have the freedom or also have the flexibility to give out incentives, to give out subsidies, and to bring in stakeholders. I think space is the issue, not only in Taiwan, but also in many other, uh, other countries as well. Uh, by introducing charging facility, we are bringing back the parking spaces, which uh, most of the cities have tried so hard in the past decade to remove. And I, however, I think um, uh, some cities in Taiwan are, are, are trying to be creative by utilizing the existing parking facilities and to um, sort of to allocate uh, 20 here, as we can see, 12% of the space for charging facilities or at least one charging spot for every 50 spaces, 50 parking spaces. And the Taichung city also has um, gone the extra mile to uh, bring all their government agencies, local government agencies to, together and to, um, I would say, to mobilize the resources as to how much of the space they can, uh, they can use. Not only the Transport Bureau, uh, on the Transport Bureau there are definitely parking facilities, but also in museums and in cultural centers and uh, in, in sort of libraries. Wherever there are uh, extra spaces or abandoned spaces, there are the opportunities for Taichung City or local governments in Taiwan to transform those spaces into something that is more incentivizing for uh, the, the installation of electric vehicle charging facilities. And for incentives wise, I think um, it's, it's usually very hard to bring stakeholders together, especially from the private sector when the signal is not entirely clear. And uh, however, I think for in, in the case in Taiwan, the Environment Protection Bureau always has that extra uh, budget to actually bring in or encourage public sectors to install the charging stations. Here, when we say the public sectors, and they can be the shopping malls, they can be um, the commercial sort of uh, business premises and office buildings or even universities as well, they can apply for the subsidies to install charging stations on their properties or on their land. And eventually, I think uh, for charging at home, it's quite a barrier, which I will touch upon later on as well. Um, so uh, local governments actually are not encouraging the installation of charging spots in housing complexes. I think it is it is very familiar to many of you here simply because 
Asian cities and countries are usually quite densely populated and we definitely have to find a way for uh, the residents living in the same housing complex to share charging spots and sometimes even installing charging spots in the shared parking garage will be very challenging. And last but not least, I think looking forward, um, there are, I think, if I may say, three main key challenges to be resolved or needs to be resolved. And first of all, is the policy and regulations, as you could see early on, that there is a bit of a tricky or gray area for horizontal integration. And it's always a tug of war between Ministry of Economic Affairs that has the budget, has the funding, has the money, and the Ministry of Transportation, which usually is not so well off, as opposed to the Ministry of Economic Affairs and the Environmental Protection Administration, whereas, however, Ministry of Transportation usually owns the properties, the infrastructure, parking lots, railway stations, the key transport interchanges. They do have the potential to transform these spaces into usable charging infrastructure locations or even charging hubs. So there is always a bit of a tug of war between ministries, the key two ministries. But at the end of the day, I think we have to think about which ministry is actually is in charge of decarbonizing transport. I think at the end of the day, it is Ministry of Transportation who has to wave the flag um, sort of um, of decarbonization of transport. However, if it's in the realm of Ministry of Economic Affairs, that would be really hard to go that extra mile to really decarbonize our trends. But I think at the end of the day, at the back of the government's mind, I think that's an issue that will emerge in the long run or in the midterm as well. So there is a lack of horizontal integration and vertical integration, as you might see early on already, the, the alignment and streamlining uh, of subsidy programs varied a lot, whereas at the national level, the Ministry of Economic Affairs also have um, uh, the subsidy program for private sector uh, to install charging spots and charging facilities. However, at the local level, there's something similar in place. And from time to time, that confuses the public sector as to which rules to follow, and which regulation to really abide by and which legal binding uh, is more powerful than the other. I think there is a, a gap here in terms of vertical integration. And spaces and location wise, I think as I touched upon very briefly earlier, shared charging spotting housing complex is always very tricky. And also simply because we don't really have the full picture yet of how electric vehicles are used. Because by understanding how our electric vehicles are used, will we really have the capacity to understand where to install the charging stations, what type of charging uh, facilities um, we can have. And of course, the I think the, the benchmark or the baseline will be we have to understand the destinations and pit stops, which boils down to the very basic transport planning techniques to understand how those vehicles move. Otherwise, we won't be able to know maybe charging, whereas in the residential area, we could install just standard charging, whereas at the moment, we don't really have the full picture that makes, again, the shared charging spots in housing complex quite tricky because it's a residential area, but of course, we won't be able to satisfy all residents once they all have electric vehicles. Whereas do we have to set up, say, charge extra charging spots near the residential area on public land, which can be quite controversial. So spaces wise and location wise, we don't have the full picture yet. I think this is still something uh, we uh, have to say that, that is still work in progress. And last but not least, I think learning by doing is what cities in Taiwan are still um, trying to um, trying trying to master, if I may say, because um, uh, cities in Taiwan, even though like people think of Taiwan as a kingdom of say, oh, ICT, you guys have 
um, different sort of high tech technology products and all that. But when it comes to the really the implementation and application of EU um, charging, I think we are on the same trajectory to learn how the best to install the electric vehicle charging infrastructures and how the best to uh, also jumping on this opportunity to transition to renewable energies. So, so at the moment, policy really varies from city to city in this very early stage. So the example I gave early on is the example from Taichung City. Taipei City has its own example, has its own policy. Tainan and Kaohsiung have their own policy. And also the official guidelines remain to be seen. I think it's still at the very stage that cities are drafting their official guidelines, but at the end of the day, hoping that the integration of different successful stories and policies will be merged and integrated as a rule book for all cities uh, to look up to, to refer to. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, for the interest of time, I am hoping to share more uh, stories and the uh, information with you in the following trainings and hope you have the, the nice rest of the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Suri. Uh, indeed, the case of charging infrastructure in Taiwan is very interesting. So in your opinion, what is the future of hydrogen fuel cell vehicle? Yeah, we need a crystal ball to answer probably. <laughs> but in general, my personal opinion, I don't want to attribute this opinion to the company for which I work, is my 30 years experience. There are a lot of common elements among the two technologies. At the end, if you see the vehicle side, a full cell vehicle and a battery vehicle is in common near all the components, transmission, motors, inverters, and so on. The difference is the storage part. Obviously, uh, or not obviously, maybe not, uh, it's important to take care that the sizing of the battery depends on the energy. So the higher is the range I want, the bigger become the battery. While the full cell system is mainly driven by the power I need. To say what? That for low range, like urban, like small vehicle, battery are more than enough and it's okay. For longer range, like heavy duty, long haul tracks and so on, and instead of electrify all the highway, maybe the idea to take care of hydrogen can be taken into account, considering that the CO2 reduction goals are not only for us in transportation, but for all the production energy sector. And in that domain, Hydrogen seems to be one of the few weapons they have to really go down to the zero CO2. So I feel this will be an asset available, and I feel not wise to fight one against the other, but look the pros and cons and use the one better according to the need. Thank you so much, Victoria. That's, that's really a comprehensive answer. Uh, a very final question to all of you. Uh, I think uh, most of our presenter or speakers has left. I think uh, Harm, Victoria and Doc Mani are there. So uh, just final question, maybe this is maybe a little bit uh, out of scope, but uh, with increase of e-mobility, there is an issue of electricity, electricity demand. So how can this be taken into account in a city or country? Uh, maybe, yeah, who would like to start here? Yeah. My, yeah, I can say something. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please, go ahead. No, please, please. You first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to, uh, the um, uh, so the, the the lack of electricity, but especially the lack of of grid capacity, is the main uh, main uh, issue. Um, and by smart charging, already quite a bit can be uh, attained. Um, so be, because it's normally not the, the capacity, but it's the peak capacity that's in the, that's the problem. And um, uh, also the, the, uh, the, uh, the possibility to go one step further or to store uh, the, uh, the capacity in the vehicle. So either in an outside storage on the battery, of course, is an option uh, to reduce, but also quite expensive. But especially also in the storing it in the vehicle and being able to, to deliver back into the grid. That's normally not with high volumes, because if you have a city with, uh, 
uh, thousands of EVs, and 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 uh, and, 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 and percentage of these is connected, then you normally need quite, yeah, you don't need so much uh, and, uh, capacity uh, at a at a certain point to already lower the stress on the on the grid. So that is uh, one of the uh, the things where I think all the uh, the car manufacturers, the the uh, the charging and the infrastructure manufacturers, uh, the utilities are working uh, towards. Uh, the the a very essential point is to do it in a way that it benefits society, so that the uh, the uh, the uh, mainly the, uh, the the electricity, the grid operators, the DSOs, are able to utilize this system as well, um, uh, without having to pay a high cost uh, for that. So that's important. Um, and of course, the standardization that you can do that all over Europe uh, in, uh, in the same way, with the same vehicle like you charge, that you can also do that uh, with, uh, with recharging and delivering back. There are multiple projects coming up. I think uh, yeah, Victoria and I spoke about uh, such projects also together, uh, submitting both uh, proposals to new, uh, new horizon calls. So it's also interesting. Um, so there's plenty of things going on in, in Europe on this uh, field. Very, very, uh, yeah, very interesting at that point in time. Yeah, if I can just mess up a few words. Yeah, sure. In general, at least in Europe, the logic is to have a grid that is able to distribute the instantaneous peak power. So the grid itself, I mean the high voltage part between the big plants and the distribution is sized for the worst condition. And that's mainly due to the fact that up to now we are not being so effectively installing locally electricity. The thermal is totally different. We store thermal very easily. Uh, clearly, the point that this, in this case becomes not so much uh, are we able to produce the energy of all the vehicle, but uh, as said by arm, when is a matter of peaks, not a matter of average. And a way to try to leverage the issue, as presented in different presentation by us, is to take care of the management. Vehicle bidirectional, local battery pack, maybe hydrogen local storage can help to balance the peak request, avoiding to ask the, all the system to produce instantaneously this peak, making possible to manage everything. I don't want to say with what we have, but without doubling, make three times uh, the, the plant we have today. Clearly means uh, programming, organizing, uh, work together, find a real ecosystem. I come from a business in which car makers do their business uh, and the other make them. Here, not more possible. We have to work together, otherwise no solution. Exactly. Yeah, talk money. Yeah, I, I think they, they mentioned already almost almost everything. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I agree that demand management would be the very important component really in here. And it's, it could be a policy driven, it could be regulation driven. Because uh, if, you, if you've got the regulations, then the, the operators, for example, will be forced to optimize their operations. Okay, we did some pro one project before, we look at buses, fleet of buses. And uh, by just optimizing the charging schedules, operation space on dispatch schedules and everything, you can happen to bring down the peak loads of, of your operations. So, but with, with regulations and buses, bus operators, for example, or yeah, GP operators will be forced to, to optimize, to look for ways okay, on, on, how, on how to bring down their peaks. Yeah, and then maybe introducing some time of use uh, uh, charging in, in developing countries like the Philippines where in finances is very important, then that, that, that would help a lot. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. So with this, I would like to conclude. Uh, so yeah, in many parts of the developing countries, uh, mainly in Asia, where infrastructure is still need to be developed, this insight today on key consideration on charging, charging infrastructure types, uh, standards are very useful for future planning. So not to forget the stakeholder engagement in the planning pro process, of course. So with this, I really want to thank you uh, for your, uh, for your, I mean, for the for the presenter at least uh, for your presentation and also for the participant. So um, with this, I just want to go quickly for our future uh, coming up uh, training program. 
So I just want to inform you about the economy of training program specific uh, for our solutions for cities in Kathmandu next week, starting from 26th of October till 29th of October, followed by uh, Hanoi, Hanoi training between 2nd and 5th of November, and lastly, uh, PASIC training between 9th and uh, 12th of November. Um, so the presentation and the discussions are, are uh, developed to be suited to the local context in the respective cities, but we would highly welcome interested participants outside the cities into the training uh, session uh, as well. So um, please register yourself if you haven't via Solution Plus website. And also not to forget to, the, to, to all the participants that uh, we, will, we will be sending you the evaluation form of all these uh, three training days. Uh, so um, uh, so to, to plan our uh, future training. So this will also have an opinion to, uh, yeah, to, 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 to specify or to focus where our training focus would be, uh, would be interesting for you in the future. So with this, on behalf of Solutions Plus Asia team from Kine Asia and with Pupatal Institute, I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for your contribution as well as participants for joining this training. So see you in cities specific training. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.